Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, June 26, 2023 at 6 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting a work session on City Support of Economic Development. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for June 26, 2023. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Our work session topic is city support of economic development. I will turn it over to Mayor Cavanaugh. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we've got a lot of city staff here joining us. We're all gonna be presenting, and then we also have a lot of members of the public, so thank you for coming. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a quick lay of the land here real quick, so we all are on the same page, and then I'm gonna um, kick it over to Mike to, to start us off. So, um, as Adrian said, this is a work session. I just wanna make it really clear for everybody. Uh, th since this is a work session, we won't have any public input, so there won't be any back and forth from all of us but we do absolutely welcome it. So we would love to hear from you after this work session, after we've had a chance to soak in all this, after you've heard the discussion that we have here as a council. Um, anyway, you'd like to contact us, we'd be happy to, to chat with you. So feel free to do that. And that's for anybody at home listening to. Um, and for the council, this is my thought for tonight. So we've got a lot of information that we're gonna have coming our way. Um, as I was reading through it, and thank you very much for the time to do that, um, to staff and Mike. But as I was reading through it, I realized that some of the questions I was asking myself were being answered by the later information. So what I think would be most efficient is if we let the presentation happen in its entirety, and then we will have a chance for questions afterwards. And I'll make sure we have plenty of time for questions so you won't go away without your questions answered tonight. Sound like a plan? Okay. So we'll, we'll plan on doing that and then, um, and, and feel free to write down anything. And as far as breaks go, just take them whenever we need them. We, I won't plan on stopping us for any official breaks or anything like that. So just uh, know that we're gonna be up and milling around and that we might just stand up for no good reason just to listen to you. So don't, don't take that the wrong way. Okay, with that said then, Mike, we'll kick it over to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mike Van Milligan, City Manager. With the current economic development practices and policies that are in place, the City of Dubuque and the Dubuque region has experienced tremendous private and public investment since 2010 in the hundreds of millions of dollars. With the current economic development policies and practices that are in place, the city of Dubuque and the Dubuque region are looking at experiencing hundreds of millions of dollars of private and public investment over the next few years. In fact, for Dubuque and the Dubuque region, the next few years will see the most transformational year since the early 2000s when the America's River Project brought the Port of Dubuque development and so much more. These upcoming years will include Schmidt Island development, hundreds of new housing units, a booming sports tourism industry, including the Fields of Dreams Project, important business expansions for the McCoy Group, Cottingham and Butler, Simmons, A.Y. McDonald, Switch Homes, and others. This all comes on the heels of projects by Clower Manufacturing, Simmons, DePaco, Central Avenue renovations, downtown renovations, historic Millwork District renovations, Green State Credit Union, Collins Credit Union, major accomplishments on the B Branch Flood Mitigation Project, Comiskey Park, Industrial Park Development in Dubuque, Piasta, Dyersville, Dyersville and Keeler, and so much more. Tonight, you will hear much about those existing economic development policies and practices and the success that has brought. There is also acknowledgement that these processes are extremely complex as they exist to protect the public interest. However, that does not mean economic development policies and practice, practices cannot be improved. City staff, and I know Mayor Cavanaugh and the Dubuque City Council, are committed to listening to constituents to identify ways to continuously improve. And you will hear tonight about some of those initiatives and areas for improvements. Any economic development policies and practices have, take, have to take into consideration the need to minimize any risk to the taxpayer, to only contribute the minimum amount of public resources that are needed to make a private project succeed, and that respects the public assets that exist while being transparent to the public and providing certainty for private developers. The people you will be hearing from tonight 
are some of the caring and compassionate public servants who have made helping to create these many successes their lives work. Their goal is to make Dubuque an equitable community of choice. The Telegraph Herald had three articles this week on economic development in Dubuque and the public-private partnerships that make it work. One focused on the 20th anniversary of the $188 million America's River Project in the Port of Dubuque and talked about the bright future for that area. The other two focused on additional public-private partnerships that are bringing four flights a week by Avello Airlines, serving Orlando, Florida, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and the other, the approximately $130 million Schmidt Island redevelopment that will be occurring over the next few years. At the same time, the city of Dubuque and the Dubuque region is focused on economic development and dedicating tens of millions of dollars of public resources to that effort, bringing about important economic development successes. The city of Dubuque is careful to not ignore the responsibility to fulfill the obligation to provide other important city services, especially public safety, and the responsibility to keep the cost of city services competitive with other major cities in Iowa. You will see that as we work to create an equitable community of choice, we are outcome focused and data driven, using the four pillars of resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion. And we do that through planning, partnerships, and people. In economic development, the city of Dubuque and communities throughout the region have no greater partner than the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. An organization that has a board of directors made up of corporate executives, government officials, and union leadership. They even have a Young Leaders Advisory Board. You will hear tonight from Greater Dubuque Development Corporation President and CEO Rick Dickinson. GDDC listens to the business community and is never afraid to express if they have concerns about local government practices and policies. The Mayor and City Council has an existing annual goal setting process they complete each August to establish the city vision, mission, five-year goals, and one-year priorities. The City Council uses many methods to inform their annual goal setting process, including engaging the community in the conversation. The City Council values input from private planning efforts to help inform them as they complete their annual goal setting. Tonight's presentation will strengthen the base of knowledge related to economic development for the Mayor, City Council, and the community. Further input from developers and the community will further inform that existing annual goal setting process. And with that, I'd like to introduce Economic Development Director Jill Connors, who will kick off the presentations. Good evening, Jill Connors, Economic Development Director. Uh, we were gonna start with Rick, but I'm gonna jump right in here with my mouse. Uh, so as Mike just explain, explained, we're gonna talk about economic development tonight and kind of where we've been, what we do to make it happen, and then some of the results that we've seen through all of our funding and, and processes. There we go, that's better. And as Mike mentioned, we are here to create an equitable community of choice and we accomplish that through our partnerships, resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion being goals of ours. Here's a list of presenters tonight. Um, Rick Dickinson is going to provide some information about Greater Dubuque Development Corporation and what they do, their role in the whole mix. Myself, uh, the city attorney's office is going to present. Krenna Brum Brumwell is joining us remotely. Wally Wernamont from Planning Services, Gus Sahoyas and his team from Engineering, Alexis, Alexis Steger from Housing and Community Development, Gina Bell from the Sustainability Office, Chris Coleman from Information Services, and Anderson Sancy from the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. And then we do also have on the line Mary Rose, uh, excuse me, Marie Ware, 
Mary Rose might be with us too. Marie Ware is gonna be joining us. She's not listed as a presenter, but she's available for any questions that might come up. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rick. Good evening, uh, Mayor Cavanaugh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, city manager Van Milligan, and most excellent city staff. My name is Rick Dickinson, and I reside at 205 Hill Street here in Dubuque. Uh, I've been invited to be with you here tonight to, to share a bit about the past, present, and future of the organization I've had the pleasure of working for uh, for 28 years, hired help. I am the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And Greater Dubuque Development Corporation is dedicated to the gradual and sometimes painful uh, pursuit of economic development amid the realities of divergent opinions. That's the nature of economic development. Every city lives in a parallel universe between somewhere between success and failure constantly. It's not about the makeup of things. It's not about the funding of things. It's about the people of things. Who is in charge and how do they deal with the issues at hand? And how do they communicate and collaborate with one another? This constant push and pull between success and failure, I think, was uh, best described in the 19th century, about the 18th century, by a guy named Charles Dickens. Now it wasn't Dickinson, it was just Dickens. In his tale of two cities, he began with this. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was an epic of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. We were all going right to heaven. We were right going, all going to the other place. In short, it was a time not unlike our own. And as with any city, Dubuque is also a tale of two cities, always on the fringe, always fragile, shooting for success and growth, but occasionally missing steps. This is a chart which is a little difficult to see, but this is the population of Dubuque a beginning in 1970 out to 19, uh, 2020. You can see that we hit a pinnacle. We had finally arrived in 1976. It was always going up, up, up. And interestingly, the city council in the 1970s was defined as a pro-business council. There were some giants on the city council at that time. Um, Alan Tomes served as councilman and mayor, eventually became the director of the Iowa Department of Economic uh, Development. Dick Wurzberger, eventual uh, uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce, a great corporate citizen. Uh, Tom Tully, a businessman uh, who served on the council, and so many, so many, many others. But in 1976, Dubuque started a downward spiral. And in that council, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a firebrand named Jim Brady. Jim Brady was bypassed at the time the city councils selected a mayor from the council body to serve a term 
and didn't have an election for the, mayors, may, the mayor. So all seven councils were elected at, yard, at large, and the council determined who the mayor would be. Well, Jim Brady was passed over two times thinking he should be elected mayor, and he was not pro-business by definition. And so there was so much turmoil, they said, okay, well, let's have wards and let's elect the mayor like we elect council members because we just don't want that Jim Brady perceived to be anti-business to be the mayor of Dubuque. And so the city changed their election process. They went to four-year terms by wards of their elected officials and they elected the mayor to a four-year term. And Jim Brady ran against a very well-funded business candidate and a wonderful man and beat him with over 61% of the vote for his first term. He won with over 80% of, uh, of the vote in his second term and again for a third term. He ran as the spokesman for the citizen, the people's mayor, purging business from controlling the city council of Dubuque. And the death spiral continued until 1990. From 1976 to 1990, just the opposite of what we're talking about now, not business criticizing council because it's not pro-business, but the citizens criticizing the council because it was too pro-business, we lost over 10% of our population from 1976 to 1999. If you looked at employment, we we're at 40,378 in 1976. We dropped to 37,700 by 1984. And bounced up a little bit by 1990, but the population was leaving in groves. But that began Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. In, 1990, in 1984, giants of the business community joined hands with organized labor and elected officials and said, enough of this, we're killing ourselves, we have to start working together. And so they put funds together and they hired Walton Beckett and Associates to do an evaluation of Dubuque. Guess what? It was released on June 26th, 1984. 39 years ago today. And it said we needed to develop an organization that was a Big Ten organization, that had representation from business, from organized labor, from nonprofits, and from elected officials. And it started Greater Dubuque Development on November 5th, 1984. It was a slog for the first few years till 1990. But then we started to work out of that abyss. There was another study in 1991, another study in 1995. That's the year I came on board, when the consultant said, if you want to have an economic develop development group, you need to have economic development property available for your existing business and new business. There's a suggestion that we don't know what's going on in our community because we don't do studies. Well, we have lots of studies. We just need to read them. We need to understand them. We need to critique them. And we need to apply them wherever it makes great sense. What did the study find from, Wilson, well, from Beckett many years ago? This community needs to newly create an organization that is required to integrate and focus the community's economic development activities. In the past, economic development planning and implementation have been carried out by private sectors. There has been no comprehensive planning framework to guide the efforts of those developments. Finally, there has been no single organization entity that has formally involved all major elements of the community. The role of the organized labor and the relationship between labor and management and economic development needs to be clarified, and it was. 
We needed a manufacturing program for outreach. Manufacturing is and will continue to be for the foreseeable future the base of Dubuque economy. The manufacturing sector of the, of the economy continues to undergo significant long-term changes due to many factors. The Dubuque area and the Midwest have significant competitive disadvantage for most manufacturing in relation to other regions of the country. As a result of these factors, it is critical that Dubuque focus its attention on the problems and needs of existing uh, business and the manufacturing firms. In order to do this, a system needs to be in place whereby, whereby information can be exchanged on a timely basis among industry, government, and Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And lastly, an annual survey would serve two major purposes. First, it would provide important quantitative and, uh, and qualitative information on the state of the local economy. Secondly, a survey is an effective means of establishing and maintaining visibility in the community. Greater Dubuque Development was formed. The work began. And slowly and gradually, we worked out of the abyss. And from 1990 until 2013, it took that long to get back to 1976 levels. But we did it because we worked together. Not always in agreement, but civilly working together, public sector and private sector. The Board of Directors of Greater Dubuque Development has transformed to a much larger board with the same makeup. Principles of business and industry, service sector, manufacturing, elected officials, local, city, county, and representation from the legislature. Nonprofit involvement and ex officio representation that now includes all the presidents of the institutions of higher learning in our market. So what has Greater Dubuque Development become? Well, initially it was, had one purpose. It was chasing smokestacks, bringing new business to Dubuque because we had lost so many businesses. You saw that in the employment data. But it's morphed into much more. We began a business retention and expansion program recognized nationally as one of the best in the country. We sit down with over 300 businesses every year. Not a survey monkey. It's face-to-face -face conversations to find out what's going on in their world. We call it info action. You give us the information and we act on it. We also merge that information so we can understand on a macro level what's going on in our community and try to address those challenges. Uniquely in Dubuque, every Wednesday at 10.30 in the morning, we meet with the city manager and the staff of Dubuque to talk about what we found in the previous year, week. What did we say we were going to do last week and did we do it, Greater Dubuque Development? What did you say you were going to do last week and did you do it City of Dubuque? And if not, why not? And how can we help each other achieve that? Now, if you think that the city manager does everything I say, you're absolutely wrong. And if you think that I do everything that the city manager says, you're absolutely wrong. Do I think there have been grievances? Do I have disagreements? Absolutely. But I've been here 28 years, and I've never once stood at this podium and shared what those grievances are, nor will I. And for 28 years, whether I agreed or disagreed, I did not publicly comment about private sector employers' circumstances with the city because even though those comments would make me feel good at the time, it would be counterproductive for what we want to achieve, and that is growth. Because of those 300 interviews we do every year with the businesses in our market, we understand what businesses need, and we work toward that. They needed land and went to the city and said, please develop land so we can expand our, our corporate footprint, and you did. Please build a tech park. Please build the Dubuque Industrial Center South. Please invest in your community in the Port of Dubuque, on Main Street, yes, in Millwork District, B Branch, North End, because businesses said that's what, that was important to them. Businesses said, we need workforce. We spend nearly a million dollars a year on workforce solutions, unlike any community of our size in the country. And yes, it's still a fight. It's still a struggle. But because business tells us what we need, we try to address solutions for those needs. Businesses told us they're employees and they needed broadband. Ten, five years ago, there were two providers. Today, there are 10. And one company I'm on is building a fiber to every location, every business and home in this community, thanks to the changes the city made in their development relationship 
with broadband providers. Housing proved to be an issue through a study done by Greater Dubuque Development, and we took that issue to the council, and you changed your policies on using TIF to encourage housing development. We understood from employers that childcare was a major issue for the employees. We did a study to verify that infor information on a macro level, brought it to the community, and now we are working on childcare development broadly in the city of Dubuque. Ladies and gentlemen, the point is that Greater Dubuque Development is connected to the business community. Yes, there are grievances. I agree with many of them. Yes, I would like to see some things be done differently as related to policy. We talk about that every week. And yes, the city has changed from time to time based on those conversations, and I greatly appreciate that. I would also say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Listen to concerns, address those concerns, and realize that we're fortunate to have the team that we have. An unspoken truth is that some folks that have signed on or been critical of city policy want you to get rid of the city manager. And in fact, if you don't get rid of the city manager, they want to get rid of you. That is being said. They won't tell you. I just did. That would be a tragic mistake. Imagine what would happen if one of the deans of being city manager in the United States, seen as the example of how to do it by, this, by that field, the administrators and city managers across the country, if this city manager left and you said, well, why don't you come and work with us? Because we just got rid of one of the best. And imagine what that says about our community. Do you think I like the last two articles that were very accurate articles about it's tough to do business in Dubuque, being in charge of greater Dubuque development? It puts, us in the, it's, it, it puts us in the ditch, and we have to spend so much time and energy trying to drive out of that ditch, and we will, because we'll resolve these issues. So I'll be glad to answer questions at the end of the presentations. I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your commitment to economic development in Dubuque. All right, I'm back. Jill Connors, Economic Development Director here at the city. I'm going to present some information about the economic development incentive programs that we have and the results that we've had to date, as well as some of the planned commitments that we have in the coming five years. The role of our department at the city is, for one thing, to facilitate development agreements. So when developers come to us with either uh, commercial, industrial, or residential projects. We work with them, figure out what can work, what's gonna help move their project forward, uh, see what programs we have here at the city that can help make that happen, and draft development agreements. We also create and manage urban renewal districts. Those are the districts where we're able to use tax increment financing to, uh, to support a lot of these projects. Our greater downtown is in an urban renewal area. The industrial center, which is the yellow represented here. The tech park and uh, a variety of housing TIF areas. Tax increment financing is really the biggest tool that we use and we talk about it a lot. Um, every time you see a development agreement come in front of you, there's almost always tax increment financing. Involved, we talk about it in the sense that it's authorized by the state and we need to make sure that we hang on to that tool so that we can use it effectively. Another program that we have, which is funded through tax increment funds, uh, are our rehab and housing creation grants. Those are in the downtown and um, we have a $10,000 one-to-one -one matching grant for facade improvements. 
We have a one-to-one -one matching grant for um, planning and design of rehab projects, and then a $15,000 one-to-one matching grant for uh, financial consultant planning to go with those same projects. And I'll share some numbers in a little bit here about how much funding um, has been spent in those areas, how much that has leveraged, and how much we plan to commit in the coming five years. We also have a downtown loan program. Some of those program, loan programs come out of the housing department, and I'll let Alexis speak to those. The one uh, loan program, the most recent for us, has been the forgivable loan program along the Central Avenue corridor. So that's newer and works a lot like the $10,000 a unit grant, oh, sorry, which I forgot to mention earlier, $10,000 a unit for the creation of housing, new housing in historic uh, buildings. We also previously had a loan program that was in place when I started at the city nine years ago, and that was providing $300,000 loans to larger projects in the downtown area, many of which got used. It was oversubscribed, and there were projects that happened a number of years ago who were just given the opportunity a couple of years ago from now to take advantage of that of that program. So we really saw a lot of projects move forward maybe back in 2008, 9, and 10, thanks to that program. Some newer work that we're doing in our department is related to small businesses, and we've developed a small business grant program. To date, it's been running, running as a $3,000 grant for low to moderate income household individuals who run uh, businesses. And uh, what we're proposing uh, later in, in the month of July, I'll be approaching the Community Development Advisory Commission since they um, make decisions about the funding that's used for that program, which is CDBG dollars, and be approaching them to uh, propose to increase that small grant program from $3,000 to $5,000. We've heard from the small businesses that a larger chunk of change would be helpful they will still be directed to lower income business owners. And we do, um, I did want to mention that we'll be able to, in FY24, with the funding available, we'll be able to assist up to 17 small businesses. As well, in, in the, sorry, wanted to, I told you I'd give you some numbers. In the programs that are listed here in the, coming, in the current five-year CIP that was approved back in March, there's $8 million available for these programs funded over the next five years. Some results that we've had since 1995. We've, we've accomplished 96 TIF projects so most of those are industrial, but many are also residential. There's been a public investment of over $105 million, which has then leveraged uh, over $770 million of private investment, which is a pretty, pretty good return on investment. It's created and retained over 10,000 jobs, and that's, that speaks very highly of Dubuque, the fact that our Businesses to date have felt confident that this is a good place to expand their business. Its expansion accounts for a lot more than new arrivals uh, taking advantage of these programs. And we've created nearly 700 quality apartments downtown with these programs. You can see some statistics here that we've gathered from the Dubuque Main Street program involving how much new construction has happened downtown since 1985 and the percentage of that that has happened since 2000. The dollar uh, investment in building rehabs, in real estate sales, in public improvements, and the number of net new jobs in the downtown. Total improvements are approaching a billion dollars, which is a pretty good accomplishment. The planned investment that we have between now and FY28 equals about $90 million for the downtown and the riverfront. And I did provide to you a more detailed uh, list 
of what these numbers represent, which programs each of these numbers represents. In addition to that, there's another 23 million that's geared toward private property and incentivizing private property owners to make investments. In the industrial center over the next five years, um, we've got a current balance of $4.3 million um, that's budgeted for improvements in the industrial center right now, and then in the coming five years, it will be about $25 million that are budgeted. And you can see on the right the different funding sources that we have for the, for the projects that are planned. If you look at employment in Dubuque, we're nearly back to where we were in 2019. Uh, we're only down 300 jobs from pre-pandemic pre levels of employment here in Dubuque. So we think that speaks well to how well the businesses are doing here, and we're very happy about that. Greater Dubuque Development provided us a very nice uh, chart here to share with you about our labor force and how um, there were some dips in it, but we're on our way back up. Like I mentioned, our current labor force is over 61,000. I made a few calls to some different cities to figure out what do you do uh, for your incentive programs so that we can compare and see if you've got some best practices that we haven't been utilizing yet. So here are a few examples. In Ames, they also have a facade grant. Um, they provide partial exemption on the industrial projects that happen there, they can, which this runs more similarly to our urban revitalization program than our TIF program. So 100% abatement for three years on the improvement, five years declining or 10 years declining. In Ankeny, for their industrial projects, they do a five-year declining, starting at 75% and going down to 15%. And for commercial projects with high-quality jobs, they'll do a 10-year declining TIF for starting at 100% and cutting back to 50% by the end of the 10 years. In Cedar Falls, uh, they provide uh, land at no cost, but then attach to that a minimum assessment agreement. And they, for these projects, they do this for projects that are using the state tax abatement program. So the companies are getting some tax abatement through that program as opposed to locally. And then for commercial projects, they'll do five years of 100% TIF. And annually, they provide $20,000 to their Main Street program, who on their end provide $2,500 facade grants. So the city does not do that directly. That's done through the Main Street program. In Cedar Rapids, they have a 10-year 44% tax exemption or a 10-year 50% tax reimbursement. So that's the TIF. So again, these are in comparison to Dubuque, where a typical um, industrial project development agreement would include 10 years of 100% TIF. In Davenport, uh, they will provide a loan uh, at the amount of $30,000 per job that's committed through the development agreement. They will do TIF for larger projects. And then in certain targeted areas, they can do tax abatement for three years at 100% or 10 years declining from 80% down to 20 over the time. In West Des Moines, the TIF is not provided back to the developer. Uh, it's used for infrastructure improvements. So any traffic improvements that happen in the area, that's what that increment is used for. However, they do have some um, exceptions. They might do a five-year declining TIF from 75% down to 15. And then during the process of putting together the development agreement, the city captures fees for the outside legal costs. And uh, they are considering right now, it hasn't been implemented, but they're considering charging a $5,000 fee for staff time to put together uh, development agreements. 
I'm going to turn it over to Krenna Bremwall, who's joining us remotely. And Krenna, I'll advance the slides when you tell me to. Thank you, Jill. Can you hear me OK? Yes. All right, good evening, Crenna Bromwell City Attorney's Office. I'm gonna be covering this evening the City Attorney's Office role in development agreement and the process. I'm gonna talk about some state laws and some city ordinances. And I'm also gonna to briefly touch on real estate and some of the uh, process involved in that. Next slide, please, Jill. Thank you. So briefly here, I just want to mention that uh, while the city owns a significant amount of real estate, large portions of that real estate are not for available for sale or lease because they are parks or city facilities. Um, and they're just unavailable, obviously, because we're not going to dispose of those community assets but we do have a portion of real estate that we have acquired in a number of different ways that are for sale or lease and this uh, number this 15 parcels listed here varies from time to time as we acquire and dispose of interests in real estate but roughly at any given time there are about 15 parcels of land available for sale or lease we did formally list the parcels available on the multiple listing service back in 2020. Next slide, please. Next up, I want to talk about the role my office plays in development agreements. And as you can imagine, we wear many hats in this process. Um, the first uh, is to ensure that the terms that have been agreed upon by the city, by a developer, uh, sometimes multiple parties to an agreement, that those are captured in the document and reflect what the parties came to for a meeting of the minds. We then move on to reviewing and evaluating the agreements, the provisions and the terms of the agreement for legal compliance with state code. And in particular, what we are most often looking at are the urban renewal provisions of the state code and the urban revitalization provisions of the state code. And going just a bit deeper, kind of a deeper dive on this, if you will, when there will be a use of urban renewal tax increment financing if we want to dispose sell an interest in real estate in an urban renewal area then we have to follow the process um, that's referred to as competitive disposition within the urban renewal law and this is required but for some very rare and unique exceptions any time we're going to dispose of something in an urban renewal area and that process requires that we publish notice 30 days prior to executing an involved uh, contract to allow for submission of other proposals and that's why it's called competitive disposition the idea is we put that out there and it gives an opportunity per chance for a more competitive uh, proposal to be submitted but the reason I point this out specific to uh, urban renewal and economic development agreements is because that 30 day window very clearly impacts the timing and our ability to um, process things because we have to comply with some of these very unique time frames within the bounds of the law. Um, moving on from that, we then look at the funding sources involved. So it's not always um, tax increment financing that we're talking about. In some cases, it could be community development block grant funding that's involved. It could be housing tax increment financing, which comes with some nuanced rules. Or it could be things like the American Rescue Plan Act funding and requirements associated with those funding sources. So we're looking at a number of things throughout this process to make sure that we stay within the bounds of the rules and regulations that are applicable. Next slide, please. When we're talking about 
the laws that impact the development process, there are state code provisions and city ordinances involved. They can be related to annexation and certain uh, notifications or uh, processes that have to be followed if we're going to be annexing this uh, property into the city. Um, there are nuances to that when, for example, the property we're going to annex is within the two mile radius of another city. Um, for rezoning, there are some uh, specific limitations that I'm going to dive into further here in a minute um, that have changed over the years, specifically resulting from court cases decided by the Iowa Supreme Court. There are subdivision codes that are applied when a subdivision is proposed. And then there are specific site plan review regulations. And I believe Wally's gonna talk about uh, some, some of those in further depth. Next slide, please. Specific to the city council, um, the city council has a role to play and then also has some limitations on the role that is, is played in the economic development process. So there is a role for the council to review and decide zoning changes and to hold uh, public hearings on those matters. Uh, the council reviews and votes on the development agreements that are proposed throughout the community. Council has a role in approving plats and then uh, council is involved in the sale and purchase of real estate. And you'll see that I've got a little um, asterisk there because I'm gonna come back to that in a minute to go further in depth on closed session. Um, when we talk about the limitations um, for the council, um, closed session parameters have to be followed. There are rules and procedures that have to be complied with, um, and there are procedures to be taken advantage of related to closed session. Um, with regards to rezoning, as I mentioned previously, the Iowa Supreme Court has changed its position related to rezoning over the years. So in 2006, um, there was a case actually involving the city of Dubuque where a decision was issued by the Iowa Supreme Court where we deemed that moving forward, as was the case through 2017, that all rezonings should be treated as quasi-judicial. However, a decision was issued in 2017 involving another Dubuque County municipality, the city of Dyersville, where there was a uh, modification to that process. And so, uh, Jill, if you go to the next slide, please. In 2017, we modified our process. So from 2006 to 2017, we looked at all rezoning requests as quasi-judicial. So if you look to the bottom box in my chart there, Quasi-judicial rezoning meant that the council was limited to only consider the information that was presented and received during the public hearing on the matter um, occurring in the public meeting. No outside communication was authorized and no site visits outside of a visit by the body during the public meeting process was allowed. But after the Dyersville case in 2017, we modified the recommendation based on the court decision so that uh, traditional rezoning, a rezoning request from one standard zoning classification to another. So think from an R1 to an R2 or an R1 to an R2 or a R AG to C2, something like that, our standard zoning classifications. For traditional rezoning, the court in the Dyersville case um, indicated that traditional rezoning is to be considered a legislative function of the council and council uh, is authorized and should speak with anyone who contacts them on the matter with feedback, input, considerations to be had. And council is authorized to visit the site on their own or as a body. It does not have to, it, none of that has to occur in a public meeting either. It can, but there is much more leeway when it is a traditional rezoning. Now, the court did maintain the quasi-judicial status 
for planned unit development rezoning. And the opinion um, that I issued on this matter after the court case came out is that institutional rezoning should be treated the same way. So again, for PUD or institutional rezonings from 2017 through present day, uh, they are quasi-judicial and counsel should only consider the information presented during the hearing on the matter um, and no outside um, site visits or communication should happen um, unless there happens to be a site, a site visit arranged by the body during the public meeting. Um, now, this it's important to point this out because this is um, challenging, right? Because a PUD or an institutional rezoning may be coming before the body and people may be reaching out and then are frustrated when council members tell them that they can't speak with them about it, but they can share their um, feedback, concerns, or perspective during the public meeting. But this needs to be done to work within the bounds of the uh, law for rezoning purposes and to avoid there being a violation by the council um, for uh, of those parameters, right? And you'll see that there's an asterisk um, on there as well because these limitations also apply to the Zoning Advisory Commission. So it's not just the council. What we have done um, in the aftermath of that 2017 decision was we created a process where we inform in advance whether something is considered a traditional rezoning matter or a PUD institutional rezoning so that um, the board, the members of the body who will be making the decision don't run afoul of those rules by not realizing in advance what they could and could not do. And that is one of the uh, documents that was uh, included with my memo. Next slide, please. All right, so I told you that I would be touching on closed session just a bit more um, earlier, and that's what I wanna do here. Um, Iowa Code section 21.5 allows closed session discussion by the city council on qualifying matters and when the uh, process to go into closed session is followed. So for example, um, I included in here matters which could be considered in closed session. So evaluation of professional competency, think professional evaluations, litigation strategy, um, matters related to uh, law enforcement and uh, cybersecurity and security of city assets and information, physical structures, emergency preparedness, things of that nature. Um, the, uh, the purchase and sale of real estate and the, the justification for litigation strategy and purchase and sale of real estate more specifically, as those are the two most common, for litigation strategy, it, it's kind of like um, playing cards. You don't want to show your hand, right? When you're in litigation strategy, you can confer on those matters privately. Um, but any final public action uh, occurs at a public meeting. Uh, the same for the purchase and sale of real estate. Um, if the council had to discuss what they were willing to pay for something in a uh, public session, we would always be paying top dollar. So it gives us the opportunity to talk in closed session about what we think it is worth, how high we might be willing to go. And again, when that matter is finalized, um, there is a matter on a, an item on a public agenda for council approval for the review in advance by the public. And then there's a public vote on the matter. Next slide, please. And for context, um, from January 1 of 2022 through June 5th of 2023, uh, City Clerk Adrian Breitfelder assisted me in, in gathering this information, which I very much appreciated. The City Council met in closed session 36 times. There were 80 different topics discussed during those 36 sessions. And the 
time clocked for uh, closed session was nearly 30 hours. I think we were about four minutes short of being in closed session for 30 hours over the course of that time frame. So there is a, a significant amount of time discussion and uh, robust debate that, that occurs in these sessions uh, on those specific matters for which the council is authorized to go into closed session. Next slide, please. So what you've got here um, is uh, going back to kind of wrapping up my section of the presentation here. Um, I want to talk about enabling legislation for uh, requiring offsite improvements. And what you'll see here, um, and this is kudos to senior counsel Barry Lindahl for, for putting this information together and, and researching this. Um, you'll see that we have information on subdivision approval, rezoning approval, and site plan approval. And then you have a column for uh, the Iowa code information and the city code information. So for subdivision approval, you'll see that the Iowa code allows requiring installation of public improvements um, with subdivision approval. Um, and then in the city code, while there's not a, a specific reference within the code, the uh, case law, um, the home builders case, which was a, a case avoid, uh, involving the Iowa home builders, um, would allow for requiring offsite improvements through the city subdivision process. Um, for rezoning, there is a section related to rezoning and imposing conditions for rezoning. The city code does not include a process for off site improvements or cover a situation where a property owner does not agree to conditions. Um, and then in the site plan approval process, um, an ordinance approving a site development plan, um, when that happens or is presented to the council, the council can impose conditions on a property owner um, as part of that process, um, if the additional conditions have been agreed to in writing by the property owner. Um, within the city code, the site plan approval um, currently is not done by the city council. And so that process isn't currently available under the city code. So um, next slide, please. As the state code requires site plan approval by the city council to mandate offsite improvements, the recommendation moving forward is to amend the city code and an ordinance modification has been drafted by senior counsel Lindahl that would ensure that uh, we are compliant with the state code, that we're compliant with uh, city ordinances, with past practices of the city, and the current practices for cities all across the state, which I believe you're going to hear more about later. And so the next steps uh, for this ordinance would be to have it reviewed by the Zoning Advisory Commission, and then following Zoning Advisory Commission review, it would be presented to the City Council. And with that, I believe this is where I pass it off to Wally to go a little further into the design review process and more in depth on zoning changes. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Wally, we're my planning services manager. Um, so just as uh, Credit Brumwell has indicated, and you've heard from Jill, there's a lot of topics you're gonna to see that'll be overlapped in multiple presentations where we go into further detail um, with several of those. And a couple of them were mentioned was the offsite improvements, um, what our code requirements are, economic development, a lot of things that you'll see in my presentation that you might also see in some other uh, presentations coming before you. So um, let's talk about the role of the Planning Services Department. And when we talk about development, we're literally chin deep into it, I guess I believe you should say. Our department handles quite a bit of the development review process in the community. Um, we're usually the first people that they come into our office um, in order to talk about our rules and regulations. We get them off started um, with regards to the development review process, which we'll talk about. Um, we also talk about our imagined debut comprehensive plan and how we make sure those, those developments are in compliance with those plans. You'll see a lot of our staff reports where we refer to those sections of the comprehensive plan. 
We also get involved with annexations um, for those future developments. But also the main document that we're using is the Unified Development Code, which covers our development regulations, all those zoning regulations that kind of talk about how big a building can be, where it can build, setbacks, parking, et cetera. We also get involved with the historic preservation aspect um, with regards to demolition permit and preserving of our historic architecture helps define our community, and then all those subdivision um, site plans. So not only does the city planning department get involved with that, but also there's all these boards and commissions that get appointed by you guys as a city council. Um, the zoning advisory commission reviews those rezoning applications and like you've heard from um, Krenner with regards to quasi-judicial and traditional rezonings. Um, in addition, they review subdivision plats and actually some site plans that are required as part of a plan unit development. We have our zoning board of adjustment that has the ability to waive some of those code requirements for setbacks um, and other bulk regulations that are associated with the Unified Development Code. Our Historic Preservation Commission gets involved with review of historic properties from a design review aspect in our conservation districts and our city designated historic districts. And then also that Long Range Planning Advisory Commission, you've heard a lot of, thing about, a lot of things about urban renewal and urban revite. Those actually will go before our Long Range Planning Advisory Commission for a recommendation to go before city council. They also get involved with the comprehensive plan and our land use requirements. Our also, our department also gets involved with the design review committees. We actually have two of them. Porter Dubuque um, is a design review committee where we work with property owners located in the, in the port and in addition to several other key um, partners in our community to review uh, design and make sure it's in compliance with our design guidelines and our ordinance. And we do the same thing likewise for the Chaplain Schmidt Island. Different property owners that are, living, that are on the island that we work with um, to review and make sure those uh, projects are in compliance with the design guidelines and the process for that. So let's go into the development review process, which you guys hear me say over and over and over before we um, rezoning requests. So um, the purpose of the development review process is to bring together all reviewing departments in order to assist developers and expedite the subdivision and site plan review process. It's also an opportunity that provides um, an area where we can get together with uh, developers, engineers, and architects to do some problem solving discussions. So there are situations where we come in and there may be certain things that we can review from a standpoint um, with regards to a building code requirement and a fire code requirement if the plan could be altered, it could satisfy certain things. I know we had a situation for access, um, for ingress and egress from a building. We also had a situation for uh, distances from property lines for fire code requirements. A lot of that happens when we get all of our departments together and have those conversations um, with those developers and engineers and architects. So why do we have development regulations? Um, actually, it's there to promote health and safety and sustainability, which we're one of the few cities that actually includes sustainability in our purpose and the general welfare of our, general, general welfare of our community. It's also there to help um, with good development and support our conscientious developers and to protect existing property owners and uses while providing for future generations. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our development review team. Um, as uh, Rick Dickinson has indicated, um, we looked at that chart, what happened in the 1990s. Um, we actually took in consideration some of that study and, and it, we developed a process called the development review team. That began in 1990. And we actually host weekly meetings with property owners, developers, engineers, and other design professionals. That actually is a standing time frame on our calendar every Thursday from 10 till noon um, that is scheduled on multiple city departments calendars for our opportunities to set aside time to review these developments that come before the city. And the responsibility of that design review team is to review minor and subdivision plats, or reviewing site plans, and then also conceptual development plans for plan unit development. So to start off that development review process, we actually have what we call a pre-application meeting. This is a meeting where we sit down with a developer or prospective um, project and they have an opportunity to sit down with the engineering department and the planning department to look at uh, high level conceptual layout plans, what's gonna be required. We actually have changed that process. We actually include everyone in the development review team now um, for that opportunity where they can come sit at the table talk about the project before they actually get into the nitty gritty of the details with regards to the development in order for cost saving measures to help identify what may be required like a traffic study, certain other things they need to be looking at before they actually dwell down into the development. 
The next step in that process is what we call our plan review and approval process. That is the actual the development review team. That's where we're sitting down, we're reviewing those plans that come into our office. They get distributed to multiple um, department members, which you're actually gonna hear um, brief and shortly uh, with regards to that. Um, I've actually asked each one of them to come up here and talk about what they do and the process instead of you hearing me repeat it all the time at previous city council meetings, it's nice to see a face with regards to that. But um, they're looking at using city codes to include our unified development code, our SUDA standards, sanitary, stormwater building, and fire. We have multiple design guidelines that we have to follow. And then sometimes those reviews do take multiple times to review depending on the complexity of the, of the application. But then also the complete, completeness of the application um, based on what's being submitted to our office. And then the, the third part of that is the construction review and approval. This is typically being done, um, um, uh, being conducted at the same time we're reviewing the site plan review process. This is the inspections and constructions division. They have the ability to review pipe, um, site plans when they're looking at actual structures themselves um, where we're looking at the overall site and the development in the area. So our core members of the development review team are the planning services department, our engineering department, Water Department, Fire Department, and the Inspections and Construction Services. So now I'm gonna ask those members kind of get up um, and kind of explain what they do. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, Sheena Moon, who actually is our, our main facilitator for the process, so. Just adjust that a little bit. Hi, good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Sheena Moon, I'm an Associate Planner with the Planning Services Division. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you to share a little bit about my role. Uh, as the DRT facilitator and coordinator, I serve as a primary contact for all applicants and developers. This means that we serve in an educational role to help applicants and developers, uh, to help them learn and teach or educate them about our process here in the city of Dubuque. Uh, we, ed we encourage and schedule and facilitate all of our pre-application meetings. We are responsible for handling all the application materials uh, and making sure that those materials are distributed to our development review team uh, to allow for adequate review. We're responsible, uh, we also, um, I also set up the meeting agendas and distribute, as I mentioned, applicant materials to our, our team, lead the DRT meetings and facilitate the discussion, and then assist in scheduling interdepartmental meetings as needed uh, and provide applicants and developers with a, a summary of any comments that were provided during our meetings as well as uh, the uh, approval letters when, when they are appropriate. Uh, in a, an additional role, I also um, make sure that our, I review our plans for compliance with the city's unified development code. Uh, this includes looking at items such as land use, parking, landscaping, lot coverage, uh, street frontage, uh, and all other bulk regulations. Uh, and then also identifying whether or not a development might require a review by one of our boards or commissions, and then helping facilitate uh, that process simultaneously with our development review process. So, thank you. I believe Nate Kiefer in engineering is going to be next. Thank you, Sheena and Wally. Over this just a little bit. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. City staff, uh, my name's Nate Kiefer. I'm a civil engineer and land surveyor in, in the engineering department. And um, my main role is to, uh, sorry, my main role is uh, I'm the client, I'm basically the liaison between the DRT uh, folks at uh, planning services and the engineering department. And um, because I'm not an expert in all civil engineering, uh, aspects of civil engineering, we have developed a, a whole team. We've compiled a team in our engineering department, and that team consists of Darren Muring, who's not here tonight, um, Justine Hall, Max O'Brien, um, Dwayne Richter, and Nathan Steffen. And all of those folks are gonna be coming up after me to talk about their specific um, niches, their areas of expertise, and, and, and what they do. So they'll, they'll follow me. But for my part, in particular, um, when looking at site plans and subdivision subdivisions, I review things that a lot of things that have to do with um, boundaries um, because of my surveying, uh, surveying background. So I look at platting, I look at easements, I look at property rights, encroachments on our easements and property rights. So protecting our um, easements and infrastructure. Uh, I also help with, um, uh, sorry, I also help with um, our, 
or uh, if there's a development agreement that's associated with the site, we'll help with that. To, um, and the other, the other thing, the other role that I have is um, as the DRT coordinator, making sure everyone's getting their comments in, getting their comments in in a timely fashion. And if there is something that um, is going to take longer than the normal, Wally said we have, we have, we have two hours um, on Thursday mornings. Um, if there's something that's in addition to that, let's say for an example, a subdivision um, would have a uh, lift station involved, um, that might be its own separate hour meeting, and so we don't have time at the regular meeting. So I'll facilitate and uh, schedule additional meetings between a developer's engineer and our engineering group. I also also may set up meetings um, with our traffic uh, traffic staff to look at a traffic impact study and the scoping for a traffic impact study. And if we have a project that's come in, and for some reason that developer hasn't already talked to, let's say, for example, economic development, um, we'll set up, we'll facilitate and schedule those meetings too. So, uh, and then I did say that D Darren wasn't able to be here. Um, and Darren Muring is, so I'll be going through Darren Muring's slides here. Um, these are, these are Darren's slides, and again, he's not able to be here. So Darren Muring is our uh, water resources engineer, and Darren Muring manages the city's review of the stormwater post-construction plans proposed for developments. The general goal is to verify that development does not significantly change how stormwater runoff flows from a property. For all developments that in, involve reviewing the grading plan and the proposed stormwater discharge locations. For major developments, including subdivisions, the development cannot result in the increase of runoff or velocity at any discharge location. Darren reviews the engineering calcs that form the basis of design. He verifies that the basis of design follows standard engineering design practices, such as what's outlined in SUDAS, which the city has adopted as, as code. He also must verify that engineering calculations and computer model inputs are appropriate and reflect what is, what is being proposed in the development plans. Even after approval of the stormwater post-construction plan, approval of the site plan or subdivision improvement plans, construction cannot proceed until a city erosion and sediment control permit is issued. Darren processes these permit applications. He must verify that the stormwater post-construction plan has been approved and that the state has authorized the project to proceed through their National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, general permit number two for construction. Finally, Darren must review and approve the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, or SWIP, to ensure it is in general conformance with the state's NPDES general permit number two. And with that, I'll turn it over to Justine for traffic. Hello, good evening. Um, I am Justine Hall, I am one of the traffic engineers with the city. Um, I am just going to run through some of the things that I do for development review as well. So Wally kind of uh, stamped out exactly what we kind of do, pre-application site plan or subdivision, then going to completion for construction. So um, with all of those three things, pre-application, subdivision site plan, I can, um, sometimes we do get some plats in the county that we have to look at. Um, so I deal with both of those, whether that's um, regarding traffic studies um, and analysis, I'll kind of go into that a little bit too. Um, visibility issues or site distance, whether they're at an intersection or an industrial area, that's kind of something that we just need to look at for a safety aspect and um, accesses um, or driveways. They need to, you know, be compliant with SUDAS with that as well for um, getting people in and out of their site. Um, going a little bit into the scoping meetings that Nate Kiefer was talking about with um, relations to traffic, uh, we kind of have a few options, kind of like an a la carte situation that we're trying to figure out for um, traffic analysis. So. I, uh, I know a couple coworkers of, of mine will be explaining some flow issues. Darren wasn't here to explain his flow issues. Nate did a great job. Um, but traffic is basically the same thing. I need some data on people on our, on our roads, on our infrastructure, and I need that flow data of how they're getting in and out of their site. 
So that includes trip distribution. So you know, 25 percent of people are coming from the south or the east or the west. I need trip generation. Um, whether there there's growth five or 20 years out, that is something that we like to look at, and then we can budget for um, offsite improvements. Um, Talking about that, that would be intersection improvements, whether that's, you know, we're having a large commercial development come in and we need to check A, B, and C intersections to make sure that those are up to capacity, basically, for those vehicles that are coming in based on this new development. So that's really what those traffic studies are, are looking at is just um, how are people getting in and out and what are, the, what are the numbers increasing? What are they doing to our current existing infrastructure? So sometimes that does um, push me off site and I get to go out in the field and I did get to do some data collection or I get to um, give existing data collection that to the developer or the um, traffic engineer that is doing the analysis. Um, the same with a visibility issue or, or site distance. Um, you know, just actually checking that, not using Google Maps or, or our cameras, you know, that's, a, that's an eye level thing that we definitely need to check for sure. Um, going to the construction plans where we get to kind of the final portion, I do like to review the temporary traffic control that they do have for that site, whether it's, um, you know, maybe they're just closing a sidewalk and there's not much issue in the right of way, but I do like to make sure that they are safe and that they have a plan at least for the traffic control for the site that they're building. So I think next is Nate Steffen. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Nate Steffen. I'm a civil engineer uh, with the city's engineering department. As part of the DRT uh, team, I review roadways that will become public as well as impacts or modifications to existing public roadways. As part of our review, we ensure that public roadways are built to city standards so they will perform long term as expected and have minimal short term maintenance needs. We check that the paving plan details are in accordance with the SUDAS design and specification manuals. We review design elements such as horizontal and vertical alignments, site distance, lane widths, turn lanes, clear zones, curbs, cul-de-sacs, intersections, and pavement thickness. We also review public sidewalks. We follow the city code which tells us when sidewalks are required to be installed by a developer. We check that curb ramps comply with the Americans with Disability Act. Curb ramps and sidewalks are required to be constructed so they are accessible to all users, including those with disabilities. We review sidewalk plan details in accordance with the SUDAS design and specification manuals. Next, Dwayne Richter will talk about street, light, street lights and fiber. Thank you. Good evening, Dwayne Richter, traffic engineer with the city of Dubuque. Um, I'm going to talk about street lighting and fiber optics that we typically install in any subdivision or if there's a new uh, uh, street being built so that we can cover all the conflict points um, as these roads are put in. We got in new intersections that are being placed in. So a lot of times we want to make sure that the spacing and the street lighting has a nice glow so you're not going in and out of dark areas and stuff like that. So we look at uh, the spacing that they're putting into their plan sets uh, so that there's safety on those roadways. Um, and then again, like I said, the conflict point, uh, intersection points or any other high traffic area. Uh, for the fiber optics, when we look at the plan sets, we're looking at any type of infrastructure that may be placed in there for the city, so lift stations, uh, pump stations, that we can get communications to that lift station or pump station or the parks in that area for cameras uh, and continue to make our rings for our fiber network so that if one spot gets hit during construction of something, 
we got a redundant path that we can also continue to have that communication to that infrastructure. So that's kind of a big key is getting those rings built as well. Um, once this has all been installed, then I would go back in and actually check, make sure it was followed, make sure the street lights actually work, uh, they got power, uh, the fiber optic conduit can be traced out, um, and that it was installed to the city standards. Um, I know later on, uh, Dave and Chris will be talking further about how the fiber optic conduit actually helps our public private uh, partnerships. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Max. Um, <clears throat> good evening. I'm Max O'Brien. I'm a water resources engineer in the city's engineering department um, with a focus on sanitary sewer collection and conveyance systems. Um, in the DRT process, uh, primary my primary function is to just ensure the sanitary sewer design conforms with the national, regional, state, and local standards. Um, I'm not going to read them, but they're listed there. Um, so just kind of going through a lot of those requirements, those are largely driven by health code requirements. Just for example, Justine kind of stole my thunder with the flow comment. <laughs> Providing flow that's uh, sufficient enough to not leave sediment so it, it provides adequate scour in the sewer system so it doesn't go septic. That's where a lot of these requirements come from or, or similar to that. So in addition to that, I also provide or do an evaluation of our existing sanitary sewer system, which is in the vicinity of the developments. Um, if we don't have data, I coordinate with the Public Works Department, um, go collect that data, make sure that the system is in good condition. Um, a, a lot of times I request the design flows from the developers. So I'll take that design, flow, that design information, uh, compare it to what's in the system now, make sure that we have adequate capacity. And if we find anything where it's insufficient condition or insufficient capacity, I coordinate with the various departments that would be involved to address that issue either prior to or during the development. Um, lastly, I just kind of take a big picture look between the sanitary sewer and the other adjacent utilities because nine times out of ten, the sanitary sewer is the deepest one. So if anything went wrong with it, we're we're gonna we're gonna have a pretty significant impact to be able to get to it. So I take a kind of bigger picture look, just make sure there's no conflict with the other utilities in the area. And when I have comments that pertain to the other utilities, I coordinate with that respective DRT member and provide those comments appropriately. Um, and next, I believe it's Brant. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. I'm Brant Schuler, the Water Distribution Supervisor. During the DRT review process, we reviewed the utility plans for uh, the location, the di diameter of the requested service, the connection point, the elevation of the site, the pressure zone that they're going to be hooking on to. We have uh, 12 pressure zones, nine that we pump up to, and three that we bring it back down. In addition to that, we have the control valves and flushing devices in the fire hydrant locations. We uh, review the plans for if there's a water connection fee. In uh, November of 1951, City Council created an ordinance for a water connection fee. Uh, back then it was $2.25 a foot. Today it's uh, $38 a foot. And that's our front footage. And we look for opportunities to loop our water system for water quality. We try to reduce the amount of dead ends. Uh, we have to check the I IDNR for any contamination in the area so we can uh, select what type of pipe we can use. We verify that the plans meet all the codes, and those are uh, DNR, SUDAS, 10 state standards, American Water Works Association, and our city ordinance. We provide uh, the as builds and the fire flow testing to the engineer record uh, for their development. Uh, Wally only gave us one slide to write uh, our information in. Oh, well, we do uh, many more things than that. We make all the live tabs. We go out and do the inspections. But uh, I just hit all the high points uh, on the water side. Thank you.
Good evening. I'm Kevin Esser. I'm the fire marshal. Um, I review plans to ensure that they are in compliance with the International Fire Code. We're currently using the uh, 2021 edition, which was uh, passed or adopted earlier this year by the council. Um, as part of the development uh, review team, a couple of areas that I'm looking at, the main areas, are the uh, emergency access and uh, water supply. So um, building features such as construction type, building size, uh, the occupancy, whether or not uh, the, the structure will be sprinklered or not, are some of the main factors that uh, uh, determine which codes are going to apply. Um, so for emergency access, plans are reviewed to ensure the fire codes are met for fire access into the site and around the structures. Um, this review ensures that the fire trucks are ease, can reach uh, the area where the fire hoses can reach all parts of the structure. Um, and that the, uh, the fire access roads uh, meet the requirements for the width, vertical clearances, uh, load carrying capacities, um, and then meet uh, requirements for grades. Uh, as far as water supply, I review to ensure the appropriate number of fire hydrants are available on site, uh, the building use, construction type, uh, size of building, and again, whether or not sprinklered will determine what the fire flow is needed for the structure. So when I determine what the fire flow is needed, um, I can reference in the fire code and determine how many fire hydrants are, are required for that site. Uh, the city does have a robust uh, public hydrant uh, system, um, but if that doesn't uh, satisfy the number, then we will require some, uh, some private hydrants to be installed into the, the site. So I believe that Mike Belmont is going to be following me. Good evening. Uh, Mike Belmont, the Assistant Housing Director and Building Code Official. Um, what, in, during the DRT process, uh, one of the things that our department looks at is uh, similar to the fire department, uh, but because these are really very important life safety issues, it's, uh, we do actually both look at it, and if we have any conflicts, then we can kind of work together and figure out what the best path forward is. But uh, in the DRT process, we, do, we look for fire separation distances. That's the distance between buildings. Um, if, if buildings are close together, they may require a higher level of fire protection. Uh, we also look at the uh, allowable building heights and areas. Uh, different types of constructions are allowed to be different heights and, and sizes, and so we look at that related to the code. We also look at fire sprinkler requirements. That's important during the DRT process because uh, if sprinklers are going to be required, um, that does uh, often require larger uh, water, water service to the, to the site. Uh, and the water department needs to know that so that they can appropriately size the service. Um, we look at ADA access, accessibility access uh, at, at the site level. Um, oftentimes when uh, the DRT process is ongoing, concurrently we have uh, construction plans in our department and we're doing a plan review of the project. And that plan review is related to the building itself. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, very complete. We kind of look at all of the occupancies of the building how it's going to be used, what the egress paths are, uh, how people are going to get out of the building in, in case of a fire, the alarm systems, et cetera. Um, we also look uh, at for code compliance to make sure that the proposed design meets the applicable codes uh, for that type of project. During that plan review, we are also, uh, we have the mechanical uh, inspector, the electrical inspector, the plumbing inspector, they're also also reviewing the plans uh, to make sure that uh, those proposed systems uh, would meet the applicable codes. You know, the goal of all this is to try to make sure that uh, once, once the project starts construction that uh, uh, most, if not all, of the, any issues that might come up have been identified and uh, solutions figured out prior to construction. Wally's up you get me again, guys. <laughs> so, um, in addition to those members that were just presented before you, which you know is pretty detailed, I did give them one minute per slide to provide that information, very high level. They they are very good at what they do. There's a lot of detail that, that goes involved with the review 
Um, they touched on many of those topics, but they, they are uh, very committed to reviewing these plans and make sure that they help create a safer Dubuque and meet all the code requirements that are required for all those uh, codes that we're associated with. Well, there's also other departments that are part of that development review team that may not attend every week, and those are the leisure services department. Um, that is, they get involved with, and we have uh, park development as part of subdivision plan, um, plats, and then also street trees as part of those subdivision plats. There are other associations that we actually get involved with and they're actually doing park development. So um, they're an active member of our um, development review team. Also, the health services department will be involved if there's any food establishments um, that were being reviewed and also any public pools. Um, there are many other aspects that they may uh, participate with regards to health code. And then also their public works department will attend, especially when we get involved with potential impacts to the flood wall system, um, anything that we get involved with maintenance for snow removal as we look at subdivision plants and also temporary cul-de-sacs. So a couple of things that we're looking at um, getting involved with improvement to the process. Um, we're looking at holding the development review teams meeting in person with a virtual option for the applicants. And when COVID-19 hit, um, prior to that, we were always in person. Um, we were down at the Municipal Services Center. It was face-to-face -face contact. Um, all the departments were brought together. Um, the developer or the engineer would come in and have those conversations. And since, since COVID, we've gone to a virtual option, um, which has been involved with um, everyone participating remotely. There is some benefits to that, especially if we do have developers or consultants that are not located um, in our community. Um, it does provide some benefits to that. But I think a lot of times some of the person, um, personality or the opportunity to sit down face to face and have those conversations has kind of gone on the wayside. Um, we're trying to make it a little bit more personable um, and developing more uh, opportunities um, to interact with our developers, engineers, and um, architects. We're also looking at reviewing and update our applications and checklists. Um, we have several of those that are all included in our application pa packets. They're very detailed of what we need um, for us to do our review. In addition, we're looking at identifying appropriate view times for each application types. Um, some site plans could be reviewed in as little as a week or two. Some site plans may take a little bit longer. Subdivision plats, when you think about that, and you're looking at 138 lot of subdivision, um, we're looking at the street network and the connectivity with all the utilities. It does take a while, and, and review times for those take a, um, a longer time, especially since most of those improvements are going to be dedicated to the city. So we want to make sure that they're going to meet our requirements um, and be um, in order to help uh, with that. And then also we're going to look at exploring um, software programs that help serve the, as a project management tool. Currently right now everything's being done by email and, and conversations and documenting and providing uh, letters to each other. But there are softwares out there where there's ability for electronic plan submittal update uh, where the individual departments can comment and it has the ability for the developer or the engineer maybe to check in and see the status of their current plans. It's just another communication tool to be able to use. And then also we're looking at reviving uh, the developers round table. So with that, I'm gonna go into the history of the developers round table. And that round table was initiated by the planning services department back in 1992. It was created to improve communications and coordinate coordination of city departments with each other and with, with developers. So prior to the developers round table and the development review team in 1990, Individual um, engineers or architects had to go to each individual department and talk to them um, uh, individually. So with the, the use of the developers round table and the development review team, we were able to get everyone, all the city departments in one spot to be able to uh, have those conversations and, and be able to help some of those improved communications and coordination. We're also looking at fostering and maintaining a good public-private working re relationship. Uh, we evaluate how city codes and procedures can be improved you know, what barriers exist to improvement and what solutions can be implemented. Uh, develop the streamline and document development review process. Provide in-service training on new codes and procedures. So any new code may come up, we will have an opportunity to uh, run that by the developer surround table and have those conversations. And also enhance public relations and customer servers. So, you know, who are those members of the developers round table? Um, they include, you know, developers, engineers, architects, other design professionals, um, they also include the represent, uh, representatives of the following organizations, which is our city departments, our Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, Dubuque Board of Realtors, Dubuque Main Street, and the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. 
we're not just limited to those groups or individuals. That this is a public process, and we like to open it up to anything to help improve um, the development review process in our community. Um, so when that developers roundtable was created, we were looking at you know, what were some improvements that result of that. So uh, the results of that included streamlining our subdivision planning process. It helped in improve communications and relationships with the development community. Helped shorten time frames for rezoning processes, which uh, we are by far the fastest um, city with regards to reviewing rezoning applications. And we, we can prove those in as little as 45 days. Some communities may take six months. Um, just to let you be aware of that. And then special exceptions were created for residential uh, projects, which is a, a zoning board adjustment application um, to allow smaller variances for approvals. And then also we had improvements to our development review applications. So as I mentioned before, the Planning Services Department will be reviving the developer's roundtable. And our intent is to contract with the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation for facilitation of those services um, for the developer's roundtable. Now I like to get involved with um, you know, the current status of residential development. So a lot of the questions get asked, you know, is, is, is Dubuque growing? And I think you've heard from um, Rick Dickinson with uh, kind of the same chart looked here um, that you've seen before and, and many times. Um, you know, Dubuque was in a decline in the 70s and to the 80s and 90s, and you heard that from Rick, but we've been in the process of growing ever since. Well, that can't be said for most communities uh, that were very similar to us um, back in the 70s. Um, this chart shows uh, population change from 1970 to 2020. For a lot of communities that have not been able to reverse that trend, we're very fortunate that we were able to do that. And then also uh, we look at other population trends from 2010 to 2020 for other communities located just in the state of Iowa. Um, a lot of those are in declining population. Um, we're actually, and several of our peer cities located on the Mississippi River are actually losing population. We're still continuing to grow. So the great news is that, you know, Dubuque is growing. Um, we have a 6% growth for Dubuque County. And um, in that same time period, the state's population grew by 4.7%. Um, so as you can see in this chart, um, Dubuque is in the positive direction. And you're also comparing this to larger metro areas where there's a lot of suburbs in those counties um, with regards to Dubuque, uh, we are growing. And why are we growing? Well, a lot of it has to do with some of the things that Alexis is going to talk about with some of the improvements that you guys approved with urban, uh, urban renewal and residential TIF, uh, including in your packet and also is included in you know, the memos that are provided to you, is a summary of a lot of the current residential development in our community. Um, we outlined, you know, in this case, we have residential lot availability. We talk about, um, you know, the switch homes of uh, Dubuque was just recently approved. That's going to create additional 84 lots. There are future phases to that development that will include additional 21 lots and 24 units for a multi-tenant building down on 32nd Street. We also have the estates of Dubuque, uh, which was 35 units, which I just spoke with the developer tonight, and that was almost 20, 27 of those units that have actually been constructed. We also look at multifamily developments that are new under construction. Here's a list of them. I don't need to go through quite a few of those, but we have a lot of those that have been approved and are in the process of being constructed or already been constructed. We also look at um, multifamily developments that have been approved with regards to St. Anthony School. We have the Callahan Apartments um, that are located on Bees Drive, and then we also have the Iowa Street Lofts um, located um, downtown. And then also, a lot of them that are under review that are pretty close to being approved. We have the Stacks, which is 178 units. That's that six-story wraparound building down on the Port of Dubuque. Um, they're looking at doing market rate apartments there. Horizon Development, which you just went through and re approved a rezoning request for the um, Heartland Financial Building located next to City Hall for 30 affordable units. We have the Visitation property that has been purchased by Ani and Four Oaks. They're looking at 20 to 25 additional units. We got the Carter Road Apartments, which went through a rezoning process that you guys have reviewed and approved for 40 units. And then also we're currently working on the Union Park Place Apartments and Townhouse north of the Northwest Arterio for an additional 152 units. So when we add all those numbers up, we're looking at um, 1,768 units that have been either constructed or under construction or approved or under, you know, under review. So that's a great positive uh, accomplishment for the city. We'd like to see those numbers keep, continue to grow. 
Um, is the more housing we can provide in our community, the ability we have for more population growth and more opportunities for individuals to help um, work in our community. So one thing I also like to talk about is offsite improvements. That gets discussed quite a bit when we get involved with subdivisions and site plans. So when we talk about, um, you know, what do we talk about when we talk about an offsite improvement? You know, it includes an extension of streets, water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, street lights, anything for certain developments. But it also involves improvements related to a traffic impact study, such as turn lanes, traffic singles, roundabouts, et cetera. So what triggers those types of offsite improvements? You know, location development relative to the existing structure. Um, we also look at the intensity of development and impact of the proposed development on existing utility and traffic infrastructure. Then also, once again, those traffic impact studies as needed for what we call high traffic generators. These could be major commercial development centers, um, gas stations, truck stops, subdivision development, et cetera. And a lot of that will be determined when we go through that pre-application process and we evaluate at the concept level whether or not a traffic impact study will be required. So what exactly is a traffic impact study? You know, it's, it's a study that is prepared by a qualified traffic engineer firm to assess the potential effects of the proposed development on the surrounding roadway network. The study is conducted to ensure that the proposed development will not cause undue impacts to the transportation system and to recommend any necessary mitigation measures to alleviate those impacts. So why would a city require a traffic impact study? You know, local governments like the city of Dubuque have a responsibility to ensure public health, safety, and welfare of their communities. And actually included in our Unified Development Code, we have a purpose section um, that's, I, that's outlined here. And I've highlighted a couple of sections of the actual purpose statement where we talk about you know, promoting the health and safety, sustainability, and general welfare of the community. We talk about uh, designs to lessen the congestions in our streets, to secure safety from hazards, to facilitate the adequate provision of transportation, and to encourage sustainable design and development in our community. So one of the questions that gets brought up is who pays for those off-site um, improvements that are required as part of that traffic study. So um, a lot of times, and you'll find out with the city of Dubuque and then many of the other Iowa communities, the developer may be re uh, required um, for those traffic site improvements as a condition of approval for rezoning, for a plan unit development, a site plan, or a subdivision plat. And I have a list of a lot of those approvals that have gone through that are included in the packet um, that was provided to you. And then also, costs of site improvements can also be handled by a case-by-case -case basis. It just depends on the effect of the proposed development on the surrounding uh, roadway network. We also take in consideration the rough proportionality, the impact of what that development will have on the intersection, and whether or not they're responsible for paying for 100% of the cost or a, por or a portion of the costs. So as I mentioned, um, this is a map of our community that's identified several locations where there are off-site improvements that have been paid by. Um, developers and this map corresponds to a spreadsheet and have a couple of them located in here where I identified you know what intersection had an improvement who was the developer how much did the developer pay for those costs for those intersections or offsite improvements what was the city's costs you know how was the intersection improvements required you know the date of the, that approval and then also you know what specifically is required was it, was it a traffic single was it turn lanes um, was it a right in right out access? So I've gone through and I've identified several of those because I wanted to show what the city has done past practices in our community. As mentioned before, we don't have a lot of this codified um, with regards to um, our ordinance, but this is the past, practice, past practices and the kind of the policy that the city's been following. Um, in addition, here's another uh, spreadsheet just continuing on with some of those improvements. I do want to um, pull out some of those site-specific ones um, to go in a little bit more greater detail. So when Sam's Club came into our community, um, the developer was Walmart Stores Incorporated, and we required them to pay 100% of the developer's cost for improvements at Asbury Road in the Northwest Arterial that include multiple turn lanes, um, updates to the traffic singles located at that location. They also had to pay for improvements to Asbury Road and the Sam's Club Access Drive intersection improvements, actually a creation of that intersection with traffic singles. Um, they also had the Northwestern Arterial Riding Right Out Access 
And then also, the signal was already installed, but they had to make improvements to the Northwest Arterial and Plaza Drive intersection improvements in order to make that connection into the community. And then there was a project that involved Asbury road widening, which they paid uh, $250,000 of that cost, um, which was 72% of the developer's cost, but that remaining portion was actually paid by a property owner located on the south side, which would have a future development or benefit for that road widening project. Another project I want to talk about is Asbury Plaza. Um, that developer was a Rubloff, and they paid 100% of the developer's cost with regards to uh, traffic signalized improvements at Asbury Road and Holiday Drive, uh, the Northwest Arteria and Plaza Drive intersection improvements, right-in, right-out accesses, and then also there's several accesses that come off of uh, Asbury Road. And then just recently, we, uh, we also talk about, instead of large scales, we're talking about site-specific development. Here's an example with uh, the location at Kerper Boulevard and Kerper Court. Um, this is a developer is being done by Quickstar Incorporated for a new uh, convenience store gas station located down at that intersection. And this is a situation where the developer is paying 50% of the cost for the roundabout and intersection improvements, and there is a cost share with the city um, that's paying for a portion of those improvements. Uh, and that roundabout will be under construction here this fall. So that's what the city of Dubuque does. So let's let's look at what other communities are doing in Iowa. So. Um, City engineer Gus Ahoyas and myself spent hours and hours of time trying to track down the other city engineers, traffic engineers, and planning, uh, planning personnel, city planners of these other communities here. Um, we wanted to talk to them about you know, how they handle traffic impact studies, what are their requirements for um, development, uh, who pays for what, where is the cost share, do they even have a policy or ordinance in place. Um, so we pulled these 14, 14 communities. And of the 14 communities that we pulled, 10 of them do not actually have a formal ordinance or policy. They actually handle um, most of their offsite traffic improvements on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, as they come before them, they may be reviewing them with regards to you know, what would be required um, for them to, the developer to pay for. Um, a lot of that might be also included in certain requirements uh, with regards to a site plan or rezoning. So these are the communities um, that currently do not have um, a formal policy that's been adopted by city council or by ordinance. And then we also looked at, you know, there's these four communities that have some form of policy to handle off-site traffic improvements. And I just like want to touch on each one of those. So uh, Bondurant, I don't know if you guys are very familiar with Bondurant. It's a, it is a growing city located in the Des Moines metro area. They've adopted a policy by resolution on traffic impact studies for proposed development. And that indicates when, you know, when they're required and who actually are responsible for paying those transportation system improvements. We also have the city of Cedar Rapids. They actually have an assessment policy for traffic signal improvements. It's unique in the fact that they look at all those accesses and uh, properties within 500 feet of an intersection and they determine you know, assessment purposes wise you know, how much the new development would cost. They also take into consideration if there was a demand uh, before the traffic signal would be required um, and some other uh, requirements for that, you know, if it was provided 10 years prior to that, they may not even require an assessment for it. We also have the city of Des Moines. They've adopted a policy by resolution that sets forth the processes and requirements for a traffic an uh, analysis relating to the proposed development, rezonings, and several other items. And they also note that the applicant is solely responsible for the cost and construction of all improvements determined necessary by the city as a result of that traffic analysis unless otherwise agreed in writing by the city and the applicant. And then finally, we have Ankeny. Um, they provided us with some policies. Um, it doesn't look like it was formally adopted, but they, this is a policy they do follow. It's in regards to a responsibility for transportation system improvements. You know, helps identify um, who's responsible for paying those offsite improvements as a result of the traffic impact studies. There are situations where the developer is required to pay 100% of those costs. The city does do some cost shares where, where they may pay 50% or up to $150,000 for improvements. And then also, what's interesting about their policy is if the traffic study requires additional improvements within 10 years of opening year, they may require a quarter of the percentage to be provided ahead of time to pay for those future improvements. Um, other things that we looked at when we talked about who pays for traffic studies, what was kind of interesting is, you know, most of them, 
Most communities require the developer to hire the traffic engineer. They can choose who they want. They pay for the traffic study, and it's provided to the city for the review. But the city of Des Moines actually requires the developer to pay the city for the cost of the traffic study that will be completed by a traffic engineering firm that's actually selected by the city. So the city of Des Moines actually picks the firm and tells the developer, you're going to pay us to pay this firm to conduct the traffic, traffic study. And then also with the city of West Des Moines, they actually have um, engineers in-house that conduct in-house traffic studies, and they require the developer to pay the, the, the staff of West, the city of West Des Moines during their time to actually conduct those traffic studies. So, you know, other things that we looked at from off-site improvements were the majority of the communities survey do require the developer to pay all or portion of the off-site improvements as part of the conditions. They're placed as approval of a rezoning, a plan unit development, subdivision plat, site plans, a lot of things that we're doing, but we don't actually have it codified. Um, just like I mentioned, there's 10 other communities that are kind of doing something very similar. Um, and a lot of those examples, I think I had 20 of them actually included in appendices that was in a part of your document that was provided to you. And then um, I just want to touch on uh, three of those examples with di varying different requirements for cost of improvements. Um, Ankeny um, had a building called District 7 building looking in their Prairie Trails Crossing development where they required 25% uh, of the cost improvements because the traffic signal was, was going to be warranted um, within 10 years of the opening year of the development. And then also the city of Ankeny had two intersections where they required the developer pay 50% of the cost of the improvements and the city cost shared with 50% or up to $150,000 cost for those signals. And then also the city of Marion with regards to their quick, uh, quick Star Travel Center located um, at the intersection of 151 and 62, they required them to pay 100% of the cost improvements um, that involved you know, design, construction, installation of uh, temporary signals and future permanent um, signals at that location. So what are we looking at doing? And, and Krenna kind of touched on us a little bit. Um, we're looking at many in our unified development code sections to kind of codify what we're already doing. Um, there'll be changes or amendments to the um, Zoning Advisory Commission applications procedures, our subdivision portion of the ordinance and our site plan requirements. Um, the included language is going to include that the ability of the city planner to require the app to provide study of offsite impacts of development allows the engineer to review these studies and provide recommendations of any required off-site improvements. It allows the ability for the planner to require the applicant to construct or pay for some or all the required off-site improvements, and then provides a mechanism for denial if the developer does not agree to pay off-site impacts generated by their development. Um, and then, of course, with these, and Krenna touched on them, they are text amendments. They will be going through the Zoning Advisory Commission and City Council. So there is an opportunity for public hearings um, for individuals to discuss and vo voice that um, through that Zoning Advisory Commission and eventually before you guys at the City Council. Um, that's all I have, and I will hand it off to Gus Sohoyas here. Thanks, Wally. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Gus Sohoyas, City Engineer. In recent years, we've had questions from developers regarding the city's current policy, which has been in effect since 2006, regarding the ownership of streets in commercial subdivisions. The city's current policy is not to accept streets within commercial subdivisions for public ownership and maintenance. I would like to take a few minutes to outline a proposal for a change to the current policy for your consideration. Prior to the SAMS development in 2006, the city would accept streets in commercial developments for ownership and maintenance. One example that we have here pictured is Holiday Drive uh, in the Holiday Commercial Subdivision, which was um, developed in 1999. Uh, some other examples of the city accepting streets in commercial subdivisions before 2006 are Sipel Court and Sipel uh, Road Commercial Park, Cedar Crest Court and Cedar Ridge Park Commercial Subdivision, Commerce Park in Westbrook, Mixed Use Subdivision, Stone Valley Drive and Boulder Brook Court in Stone Brook Center Commercial Subdivision, Meaning Court and Harvest Business Center Subdivision, Lake Ridge Drive in Cedar Lake Plaza Commercial Subdivision, Cedar 
Crest Ridge and Cedar Ridge Farm Commercial Subdivision, and I mentioned before, Holiday Drive and Holiday Commercial Subdivision. When reviewing the SAMS development in 2006, the city required that the internal subdivision streets be owned and maintained by the developer or the property owner. At the time, the city's position on SAMS internal street network was that it only served the local lots, the properties, and did not confer a larger public benefit. Since the SAMS Club development in 2006, the city has been consistent that this policy had not accepted ownership and maintenance of streets and commercial subdivision. This is because the city currently has over 300 centerline miles of streets and adding more streets adds to city maintenance costs, snow plowing miles, and future capital expenses. Some examples of development that this was the case is the side streets off of Plaza Drive and Asbury Business Park, uh, just uh, by AMC Theater and Blaine's Farm and Fleet. Uh, in 2007, the property owner came to us and was proposing a development as a co commercial and side streets that were all dead end. At the time, the city's position was that the side streets would remain private, and this property is currently be being developed by talent for Fox Hills uh, residential subdivision. So I, th I think there's like 330 um, apartment units that are going in that uh, property now. Uh, also, another one that's um, hasn't developed, it's the cul-de-sac in Cedar Ridge Commercial Park. This is A.J. Spiegel, was a developer in 2019, 2020. This property was proposed to be developed as a commercial with a dead-end street serving three lots. The city's position at the time was that the street would remain private. The development agreement has been approved by the city council and construction plans have been reviewed and approved, but this project has not been built yet. The engineering department uh, recently contacted several local commercial developers to ask what type of information was considered when making the decision to include public streets, public or private streets in their subdivision. We met with Mike Colley, owner of Plaza 20. We met with uh, Mr. Marty McNamer, former owner of Hampton Inn Place, Mike Portson, a commercial developer. And then we met with uh, Kyle Chris, a planning services staff that was with the city many years. Some of the reasons that developers would choose not to include public streets and commercial subdivisions are as follows. Public streets require more space. City standards require wider pavements as compared to private streets. In addition, areas for public sidewalks, street lighting, public utility increase the required over overall roadway corridor width. Space can be limited in certain sites, especially infill light lots. In some cases, some developers tend to elect, pri elect private streets over public streets. Public streets require building setbacks. For a street to be public, the developer must dedicate property to the city, creating a street right of way. Setback requirements for properties adjacent to the public street right of ways require buildings and other improvements to be set back from property frontage lines. Sites with private streets do not have to comply with building setback requirements or have reduced setback distance requirements. As stated above, um, space can be lit and limited for certain sites, especially infill sites. Again, in these cases, some developers tend to elect private streets over public streets. Dead end streets require a public space for cul-de-sac. City code requires an international fire code compliant paved cul-de-sac so that emergency and maintenance vehicles can turn around. As stated above, space can be limited for certain sites, especially infill sites. Again, in these cases, some developers tend to elect private streets over public streets. Public streets cost more. City code requires that developer bear the cost and design and construction of any street to be dedicated to the city for ownership and maintenance. As stated above, city standards require wider and deeper pavement uh, as compared to private streets. In addition, public sidewalks, street lights, and public utilities are also required. Public street width and public utility infrastructure equate to a higher initial construction cost for the developer when compared to the cost of private streets. Public streets limit future change to site layout. 
Some developers desire to have the freedom to modify the layout of the development to accommodate changing needs in their lease areas, parking areas, internal roadway locations, and other uh, private improvements. When a developer dedicates internal streets and right-of-ways to the city, these areas fall under the jurisdiction of the city, thus limiting the flexibility that a developer has to make modifications to a particular portions of their development. Some reasons developers choose to include public streets in commercial subdivisions are as follows. Public streets meet higher standards. City standards require a more robust design for public streets. Base and pavement thickness are, are greater as compared to private streets, and curb and gutter is required. Thorough inspection of materials, methods, and workmanship is required for all public streets, while private streets are not required to do so. The combination of more robust design and inspection, quality control results in the street that performs better and lasts longer than the average private street. For the reasons stated above, some developers have prospective buyers that request lots that are served by the public, by public city streets. Public streets are maintained by the city. Some developers have prospective buyers that do not want to deal with the cost or contribute to the cost and issues that come with maintaining a private street. Oftentimes, the annual cost for maintenance can vary depending on weather and material prices and thus making it difficult to budget for. We are proposing a, a new policy on city street ownership and commercial subdivisions. With that new policy, developers would have the freedom to decide on public streets versus private streets. Developers would be allowed to keep the street private if they decide to do so. Also, streets and commercial subdivisions would be accepted by the city for ownership and maintenance if they conform to the following. Streets would have to be designed and constructed to city standards. Streets would need to serve three or more private lots. If less than three lots were proposed, the streets would have to serve a greater public benefit, such as providing connectivity to existing or future street networks. Um, number four, as required of the city's unified development code, public street and utility improvements would have to be designed and constructed by the owners at the owner's cost. And public street and utility improvements would need to be inspected and tested prior to acceptance for ownership and maintenance. The benefits, the new policy would support two of the city council goals, including public streets and commercial subdivisions would allow greater vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian co connections, which furthers the city's council goal of connected community. And giving the developer options on street ownership would likely attract development in the area, which furthers the city's council, council's goals of robust local economy. So that's what I have for tonight. And uh, I think next would be Alexis. Oh, Gus is a little taller than me. Alexis Steger, Housing and Community Development Director. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do for housing programs. When we talk about developers, most often we're um, working with individual homeowners and small developers to maintain the housing stock that we have. Um, and then we work with the big light tech developers to bring on some new developments. So we, we kind of cross both those realms. We're going to talk a little bit about programs for each tonight. So we're going to start with the Community Development Block Grants and Housing Trust Fund, which are used to assist those that are low to moderate income uh, residents. So uh, two of the programs under those programs is, or under those funding sources are homeowner rehabilitation, which can provide up to $25,000 of a loan. It's a 0% interest loan. And uh, maximum payments are $60 a month, and it is based on income. And that, that rehabilitation can be for anything chosen by the homeowner. It can be a roof. It could be uh, a new kitchen. It could be just getting the house up to code or maintaining um, what exists in the home, carpets, thresholds, et cetera. And then we have the home buyer programs, which are probably pretty familiar with. They are our down payments for first time home buyers. Um, we provide mostly $5,000 loans. If they uh, come to us and are below the 30% of area median income, they can qualify for up to $25,000 loans. 
The majority of what we give out are $5,000 loans to help with down payments and closing costs. Um, with that, we provide an educational program on what, it's, uh, what it means to be a homeowner, um, such as the maintenance that you'll have to take on when you become a homeowner. Um, we'll move on to tax increment financing. We use these for our bigger developers, but we also use these for just individual property owners. So uh, the tax increment financing can come from housing tax increment financing, and that tax increment comes from um, developments that are, are new and designated as housing TIF developments. And we have uh, approved back in September the new unit creation program, which allows up to $10,000 uh, for a developer per affordable unit that's created. Um, affordable is determined by HUD. So that is 80% uh, or less of the area median income that HUD releases every year. Uh, we also use urban revitalization, and that is teamed often with our uh, low-income housing tax credit program through the state, so LIHTC. Um, that is providing tax abatement for improvements to properties. So even if it's just a parcel of land, an improvement would be a building on that land. So it can be new developments or it can be a rehabilitation of the property, um, building already existing on property. If it's affordable, um, they are afforded 100% tax abatement on, on that improvement for 10 years. If it is not affordable and it's market rate or workforce housing, then it's a graduated percentage over that 10 years. It decreases each year. And then when we get to individual property owners, we offer urban revitalization, which is same tax abatement on improvements. Um, it is 100% over 10 years if in that designated area, and I have a map here that'll show you what that designated area is. Um, the only um, qualification is that they have to make an improvement 15% of the value of the home or greater. And so this is the map that shows that downtown neighborhood. So when you talk about individual property owners getting tax abatement for improvements on their homes, if they're in that area um, in red, then they would be eligible for that program if they make that 15% of the value of the home increase on the improvements. And then you see all these little stars are across the way. Those are our bigger developments that happen with the LIHTC program. Um, and we designate individual districts for those types of developments. They don't often include big residential neighborhoods. We also have the change program. Um, the change program is focuses on things like purchasing um, dilapidated properties, rehabbing them, and selling them for home ownership. Um, we focus on low to moderate income individuals. So we and we also have HUD grants that go along with that change program and help uh, bolster that program and bring a lot of um, federal funds in. So on the HUD grant side, we have the Healthy Homes Production Grant, which helps um, assist in rehabbing the home for uh, air quality or uh, moisture issues, uh, window issues, thresholds, things like that, things that make your uh, home healthier. Lead and Healthy Homes Grant Program, which you're very familiar with, and that is to uh, remediate any of the lead hazards in a home. It does focus mostly on homes that have children under the age of six, although there is a little carve out for those that don't. Uh, we also have the Older Adult Home Modification Program, which focuses on keeping um, those that are aging uh, in place. So in their homes, um, this is uh, raising their electric outlets, putting in grab bars and bathrooms, um, cutouts for tubs you have to step over to make it just more safe for um, people who are a little uh, or over the age of 65 in their home. Uh, we also have the rental assistance, housing choice vouchers. So this is a program that uh, can provide monthly rental assistance for those that are low mod income in the community. And then we have uh, partnerships that help us with the change program. And our partnerships are extremely important in the success of all of our rehabilitation. We could not do this on our own. Um, contractors are scarce, uh, resources and labor is expensive. So um, ANI, the Affordable Housing Network, actually um, is a very large partner. They have funding from home funds that used to be received about 15 years ago and they're repaid. Um, odd loans currently, so we don't continue to receive home funds, but we're receiving the payments back from old home funds. And they get to use that to rehabilitate rental units, um, up to $40,000 for uh, rental units that get rehabbed. But they also receive funds from um, housing TIF and CDBG to do um, home ownership. So to convert homes back from uh, rentals into home ownership and make sure that they stay that way. Um, Ani is a partner in that, and they also do a responsible rent-to-own program, which is very um, helpful to have in the city of Dubuque. And then we also team with the HEART program, 
We have two uh, different programs with Heart that we team with. One's an adult program and one is youth and it's just training um, individuals in the trades of construction. And so we provide um, a home or a location for them to rehab in each program. So each program has to have its own location. They cannot co-mingle. Um, so currently we actually have them working on three homes and we do um, obviously pay for all of the renovation as well. Uh, when we talk about housing tax increment financing, which helps fund ANI and our programs and HEART and the rehabilitation of those programs, um, you, this map is showing where that tax increment financing is coming from. So these are the districts that are currently um, housing tax increment financing districts. This is where those tax dollars are coming from. So what qualifications for housing incentives? Uh, most of our incentives are for low to moderate income residents or those that want to serve low to moderate income residents when you start dealing with the housing department. Um, that is because we're federally funded and a lot of those grants are, are, are dictate that. Um, but also the housing TIF um, written by the state of Iowa requires that um, if you're gonna receive housing TIF, you must serve um, our below 80% area median income residents through affordable rent rates or what we call fair market rents, and those are set by HUD. Uh, we also have our urban revitalization incentives uh, qualifications, which is just increasing the value of the property by 15% or more and being in that designated district, which we talked about. So we called to um, inquire about what other type of incentives uh, cities are using in the housing realm to try to incentivize housing in the affordable realm, the workforce realm, and the market rate. Um, I'm highlighting here in the memo, I gave you all the information that I was given. What I'm going to highlight here is those that are a little bit different than what we do. Um, good, bad, or something that the city council could consider. So in Ames, very similar to us, um, they use three different schedules. Um, and they allow any type of unit to use those three schedules. They do not have to be affordable or not affordable um, to delineate what schedule they use for their tax abatement. So we only give the 10 year 100% abatement to those providing affordable housing. Uh, Ames get, lets them pick uh, what schedule they use that is allowed by Iowa Code 404, Chapter 404. Ankeny, uh, very, very specific, they adopted one schedule. Um, they only adopted the schedule of tax abatement that decreases the percentage over 10 years, and that's what we're offering to our market rate and workforce housing um, developments. And they only have that incentive in the downtown area. They're not designating new districts at this time. Cedar Falls has an interesting one. Um, they have a rent, rental to owner conversion incentive program. So converting single family homes that were turned into rentals back into single family homes for ownership. Um, if a person wants to do that, they can receive up to $10,000 for the rehabilitation and conversion of that property. We have a little bit of a similar um, partnership with Ani that helps us do some of that same um, thing, but just not as direct as Cedar Falls, and that we do rehab single family homes that were turned into rentals and Ani will rehab them and, re and sell them for affordable home ownership. Um, we do that uh, selling for the uh, the ownership, uh, they have to occupy it uh, by, go by a covenant. So a 21 year covenant is adopted and city council has to approve that before it's um, placed on that property when it's done with the rehab. Cedar Rapids uh, works with the Neighborhood Finance Corporation, which is a nonprofit, to do a lot of what we consider the CDBG programs. So purchasing rehab and refinancing loans, um, but they, what's unique is they pair it with forgivable loans for renovation over, four year, over the five years. So uh, if you do purchase with, say, our home buyer uh, program for down payment, they'll pair that with forgivable loan for renovation as long as they complete that renovation and are low mod income. Um, so it's a little bit unique. We don't exactly pair each one of our programs that way. Um, the, our, our only similar thing is that you can get both of our CDBG programs the home buyer and home owner rehab program, but they are two separate programs with two separate loans and are not forgivable. Council Bluffs works with NeighborWorks Home, also a nonprofit. Um, all they do is provide the programs that are similar to Dubuque um, from CDBG funds. C Council Bluffs does receive home funds, we do not, um, but also those are used similarly to CDBG. 
Davenport looks just like us when it comes to programs, um, but they're not offering the new incentives that our city council approved in September um, with the $10,000 for affordable unit creation. Everything else is similar to Dubuque. Uh, Des Moines does, still does a block challenge grant, and the block challenge grant is a competition offered to their neighborhoods um, to complete like a beautification type project or things that each home needs. Say they all need siding, they all need paint, they all need roofs, um, and they apply as a group of people um, in a team of their neighborhood, and then De Des Moines awards 20 neighborhoods of these teams um, up to $2,500 per household in that team. Um, and then they can complete that beautification project. Dubuque had a much smaller scale. Um, neighborhood associations used to be able to apply for uh, neighborhood cleanups, things like that with CDBG. Because it was CDBG funds, there was new regulations that had to be sponsored. So we moved that program to the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support, which I think you'll hear about from Anderson later. Uh, but it is not as large as what Des Moines is offering um, in regards to $2,500 per household in the, the neighborhood. Marion, um, the only difference in Marion is their tax increment financing. They allow debt instruments, uh, meaning that the city would incur debt and then the developer pays that debt back um, and the debt paid back is through the taxes created um, by the development. Um, that does go against the city's debt limit. So um, Dubuque does not do that. We don't allow the debt instrument um, debt instruments under tax increment financing because it does affect the city's debt limit overall. Um, and then they created a step-by-step -step developer's guide that is very, very neat, unique, and easy to use. Um, Dubuque's only similar thing that we have is an application for financial assistance that includes all your contacts and ask all the information that we would need up front to start the process with Wally that he talked about with the design review team, um, or to review for a LIHTC, um, or an urban revitalization. But not as much as the step-by-step -step guide that Marion has, which is pretty unique. Uh, Waterloo has developed a consortium with Cedar Falls to qualify for home funds. I said earlier that the city of Duke does not. It's because we're too small. Um, a consortium means you can, you can team up with cities surrounding you and it can cross borders. So you could talk about Joe Davies, you could go over to Wisconsin to create that consortium um, to have a large enough population, but then you would have to um, work together to serve residents from all of those places. It is a possibility, uh, something we've looked into. It is a little bit difficult, but um, the, the state, we have to apply to the state to do that. Um, and Waterloo and Cedar Falls were successful in doing that. Home funds are very similar to CDBG, have to be treated very similarly. They serve 60% of the area median income and lower instead of 80% like most of our other grants. And that is all I have, so I believe I'm turning it over to Chris Coleman. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. As Alexa said, I'm Chris Coleman. I'm the Information Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. Um, I couldn't help but remember as I'm listening to um, Rick Dickinson talk about life in the 80s, <coughs> which was when I started work. So when everyone else was seeing turn the lights off when you leave. I was one that said, eh, I'll give it a shot. Let's come back and see what happens. So um, I guess it worked. I'm still here 40 some years later. So, but I wanted to talk to you about the broadband expansion partnership, which is definitely a part of a lot of our public private partnerships in terms of developing our broadband uh, footprint within the city of Dubuque and within our, our greater region. This is an effort that literally takes a village. It contains representatives on our telecommunications working group that are from engineering, um, from the information services department, from legal, um, and is uh, facilitated by um, Greater Dubuque Development Corporation's sustainable innovation consultant, David Lyons. And so um, it's a very active group. We meet bi-weekly and go through a set agenda that talks about kind of what's happening now, what's on the horizon, and what particular action steps um, we need to take. Um, one of the pieces of the um, place that we're at right now is something we call the Broadband Acceleration Initiative. 
Again, as Rick stated at the beginning of his presentation, um, in 2016, when we kicked off this um, initiative, Dubuque had two legacy providers with aging infrastructure for internet services and fiber optic installation, as well as one wireless um, provider. And one of the most common complaints as they did the info action reports during that time prior to 2016 was there's insufficient broadband. It takes a long time to get connectivity if I have, let's say, two campuses or two different um, offices. And so it laid the groundwork really for what was the need to create a comprehensive strategy that reduces both cost and time, which are vital for development from private sector vendors that want to develop broadband and fiber optic footprints, and using a public-private collaboration, because the city had great interest at the time as well. We were developing um, connectivity to our city departments, largely fueled by, by big bandwidth needs um, with things like GIS and um, a lot of the, the things that we were doing on scanning, and so this was a need that was present for us and typically what would happen is we'd see a right-of-way permit and quickly try to mush together something so that we could have um, some kind of a, a partnership that would both reduce their cost and our time but it really wasn't very strategic and although it was getting some of the job done it, it definitely let us see what the problems were. And so what the result of this then in the outcomes that we've shared with you before are increasing um, available, accessible, and affordable broadband. I think these are the three pillars that we see um, that increases the ability to really interact and, and accomplish what President Biden has announced today of internet for everyone, but really it's about connectivity that's available. I have the service available from multiple carriers. It's accessible. I can actually get the service that's promised, and it's affordable whether I um, can afford the very high bandwidth speeds for business and for residents, or whether there's some sort of a supportive environment like the um, affordable connectivity program. Also, a similar problem at the same time was the resiliency of our broadband connections into and outside of the city. Um, at the time, we had one carrier that was carrying a great deal of the backbone traffic as we made connectivity to other points of network services providers and as well as connecting um, businesses to other areas that they were connected to. So improving that resiliency, connecting to multiple paths out of the city to the north, to the west, to the south, and to the east. And also, ancillary to all this and wrapped around it, again, is digital equity, allowing all residents access to become digital citizens within the world that became all too prevalent in 2020 when the pandemic hit, and online was really our only ability to work, to go to school, to access healthcare, banking, and to connect socially. So as we looked at this in terms of our telecommunications group, one of the feedbacks that we received from vendors that gathered in a round table um, that would potentially develop in Dubuque, that was facilitated by Greater Dubuque Development, that said the thing that takes the most time are the terms and conditions, the structural financial relationships, you know, how do we how do we get these things to happen, as well as kind of a, a, a bit wonky um, system of ordinances and permitting in the right of way that took a lot of steps. And if we remember going back is it's about cost and it's about time. So how can we get to market quicker, preserve the right of way and do it for a lower cost? And so at the same time, ancillary to kind of coming up with these master services agreements for public-private partnerships, we also updated the ordinances, looked at some streamlining in the permitting, as well as how can we make the communications licensing more or less a one and done. If you've got a master agreement, you've got a, a master communications license that umbrellas over all of this. It doesn't take away any of the inspections. It doesn't take away any review. It just says, let's get these T and Cs out of the way early. 
And it also created a collaborative process between public-private partners so that once we did the master services agreement, took those to you as a council, then below that master service, there were project statements and amendments that said I would be working in different areas of the city so that we could move that on along very quickly in terms of how we got folks in the ground as well as partnering um, on the things that we need. So some of the value to business um, and as well as our anchor institutions, which is where we started our emphasis in terms of responding to those info action reports, were fiber expansion and partnerships. And I think you can see from this graphic, um, these are all of the different entities that we now have in 2023 that we have a, an agreement with in some sort. And um, it really tells the story that it's not just about how many, but it's also about the choice, the redundancy, the competition, um, and, and really allowed us to be where we're at today and build upon the success we had to be a community where fiber to the home is being built over a very aggressive schedule over three years. So one of the pieces of that was a lot in part to the work that the traffic department and engineering has done along with some of the work and the groundwork that information <coughs> services laid in our early years. We've been doing fiber optics since 2001. So I suppose I could say we were doing fiber optic before fiber optic was cool. However, <laughs> the first thing we did was a small strip from City Hall Annex to um, uh, the law enforcement center and caught a few parking ramps in between and then made it down to Harborview and we were like, wow, this is really something. As well as working with Mediacom on something we called the iNet, which was dark fiber that were provided to a lot of our city buildings. But via the traffic program and via the public-private partnerships, you can see the exponential growth that has happened in terms of lineal miles of shareable fiber. And I think also this provides for us a very leverageable investment um, in terms of future um, kinds of partnerships that we would do in terms of this. So I wanted to highlight, I did list in your materials a lot of the partnerships that we've done, but again, the end game really is, well, who, do, who was served by this? And sometimes we know it and sometimes we don't, but these are some of them that I'm aware of that were served. So one of our very first um, public-private partnerships, and this was really our pilot that we used to um, get, the, get the pieces together that we needed for master services agreements in the process was Wisconsin Independent Network, or WIN. And their project was to get across from uh, Illinois into Iowa across the Julian Dubuque Bridge. That's no small feat when you consider, you know, lashing fiber optic to the bridge. They've also done a secondary project that um, did some repair on that. But in 2016, they needed to get from there and then up to a key point at 3rd Street um, where there's a lot of telecommunications building and they needed to connect one of the hospitals to a data center. So as part of that project though, we, we mapped a route out that said, hey, if you go from here to here to here to here, you can pick up a lot of the places that we need as a city as well. So we laid the groundwork really for how do those shared services work. Another large provider that we have in the city and it's been a continuing partnership is Unite Private Networks. Um, some of the work, and I, I put it in your materials too, is you know, how, how did we get 5G and some of the towers that came to the city for both US Cellular and Verizon? There's a backbone that has to happen. So UPN was one of those groups that did that. But they were also a provider that utilized the 16th Street Bridge um, to get over to some of the services needed at the Port of Dubuque, as well as Dutrack and Riley Auto. And so, again, as we're going past these, then there's also city assets that we connect the dots to. Alliant Energy in 2020, I think, around that time, started a major connectivity project that connected um, their uh, generation distribution and office facilities in Iowa and Wisconsin, and they needed to take a major path through Dubuque. So that got the other bridge um, for connectivity into Wisconsin, as well as, again, um, you know, connecting to some of the assets will be needed for development on Schmidt Island. And Iman, I think we've come to you several times and you've heard from Iman in terms of the work that they're doing for fiber to the home and they've also partnered on several different projects with us and some I highlighted here was if 
Um, you drove on Grandview any time last year. Part of their fiber to the home also gave us connectivity for the lighting project that will be on Grandview, um, as well as connected then down Mount Carmel, which is a very rocky, um, not very nice path that they went on. They did some connection for us to the Mystique Ice Center. And they're responsible for a lot of the partners with a partner organization of theirs called Ovation Networks for the B Branch Central Avenue Corridor Wi-Fi um, and also in the parking ramps that they continue to work on. I'm on, as I'm sure you're aware, is very aggressively also working on fiber to the home. And again, when we think of building blocks, we had WIN, and then we had these other projects, and then this eventually built a community that had a very collaborative process for them and able to work within um, to make these kinds of things happen and happen very aggressively. So at this point in 2023, and when I reported to you during our budget hearing, they were at about 12,500 addresses served um, using both aerial and buried fiber optic cable, a lot of it partnered with the city. And by end of 2024, their expectation is to pass all addresses within the city of Dubuque in order to have that availability of um, fiber to the home. So what does that do for residents? Um, I think you know, work from home is, is front of brain a lot of times when we look at why would we want to do fiber to the home or partner on broadband expansion. However, I think it goes more than that really in terms of creating um, an ability to upscale and take classes whenever you want, however you want, on your own time in your own schedule. Um, allowing local employers to do um, attract and retention of talent that said you have the ability to work from home. Um, it, it can also create um, more support and growth of our anchor institutions, which oftentimes we, we think about business, but we, we also have to think in terms of schools and universities and even some of our religious institutions or um, some of our, our kind of public um, help kinds of organizations, as well as creating that equitable environment for um, entrepreneurship. We also have a great deal of our own needs and one of the, the things that we're working on with the American Rescue Plan dollars are connectivity to a lot of our needed assets for the city, parks, additional cameras, pump stations, um, you know, for water and for um, sanitary sewers and things like that. And so we've identified well over 200 sites um, with in mind that this is those what I call last 100 feet kinds of projects where we have a backbone or a piece of fiber that's been put in by other vendors, then how do we get that last 100 feet? But again, it's about better serving residents for a safer and um, using the data-driven aspects of the community um, to make better decisions, um, as well as for some projects like smart parking um, for it to be available. Also, I always think of, well, what if we didn't do this in 2016, what would have happened? Um, it's, it's my opinion that we sincerely would not be here with 12 vendors that are supplying fiber optic and the amount of, amount of footprint that we've increased, um, as well as incurring increased cost for us, as well as vendors if they're doing work in the city and lost revenue. Um, that our partners have been able to obtain by bringing connectivity and services. Um, in closing, just I, in 2020 was the last time we reported to you about some of the broadband um, initiatives that we were doing and kind of how we were doing and the headline was up to the challenge. Um, and I think what I leave you with is thinking that we've had some great success However, we still have a challenge in front of us in terms of an equitable distribution of broadband within the community, an affordable um, distribution of broadband, as well as making sure that it truly is internet for everyone, as well as that um, connectivity. And so those things that we learned in the pandemic, again, are very applicable still today in 2023 of what those challenges are. An ancillary challenge, and again, it's no good deed goes unpunished, it's just the amount of work that's happening. I give great credit to the engineering department that are keeping up and continuing to work in the field um, for, for approving those um, projects. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Anderson.
Good evening. I'm not Anderson. I'm Gina Bell, City Sustainability Coordinator. I'm sorry. You're fine. <laughs> Gina, who looks like it? No. <laughs> All right, now that we clear that up. Uh, good evening. I'm the City Sustainability Coordinator, Gina Bell. I'm going to talk a little bit about our sustainability efforts as it relates to economic development and um, making sure that we're supporting the triple bottom line. So you all know that we have a long history of sustainability in the city of Dubuque. I'm not gonna go into it. We have, you've heard from me in work sessions and we have multiple uh, handouts that you can read about it. But we do know that for a long time, Dubuque has been committed to sustainability and um, it's, it became a priority in 2006 and um, that was with former Mayor Buell and it has since become a priority every year since. Um, most recently, we've been implementing our climate action plan as a high priority. Um, the three-legged stool concept also came about back in 2006, um, and the city set out to create a model of sustainability, not only for the city of Dubuque, but for other like-sized communities. And the idea was, um, if we can implement sustainability in our work, we can get ahead of other cities, um, but we also want to learn from them and support them in that work. So we formed a Resilient Community Advisory Commission. We hired the first sustainability coordinator in the state. We set an aggressive target of reducing our greenhouse gases by 50% of our 2003 levels by 2030. And that was in 2011. 50% by 2030, you'll hear all over the place now, but not in 2011. So that was a really big deal then. Um, in 2013, we adopted a climate action plan and we updated it in 2020 to make sure that we not only included reduction ideas and targets and actions, but also ways to adapt to a changing climate and make sure that we consider equity in those um, efforts. So part of our model at Sustainable Dubuque is this three pillars of sustainability. So we wanna make Dubuque livable, viable, and equitable, and we do that through environmental and ecological integrity, economic prosperity, and social and cultural vibrancy. And economic development and prosperity is a critical component of this. And um, for each of these circles and pillars, there are four principles of sustainability. So we have 12 principles total. And the four that relate to economic prosperity are good community design, um, a strong regional economy, smart energy use, and, um, and resource management. So making sure we know um, that we're reducing, we're reusing, and we're recycling what we um, can't use. So these remain sort of the pillars of the work that I do and the work that you all support. And together, um, they balance. And you've heard me talk about the interconnectedness of this work. And um, everything that the city does is interconnected. And this is how we build resiliency in our community, is making sure that not one of these uh, plays a more important role, but that they're each balancing each other. And we're working together to make sure that these are um, in alignment. So there are many, many examples of ways that um, the city has put forth sustainability in this balanced model, and I want to highlight a couple of them. So the B Branch Flood Mitigation Project, um, certainly it's a climate adaptation project at its, at its core. Um, we are trying to reduce flooding in neighborhoods, but in doing so, we wanted to be protecting residents and businesses. We wanted to create park. We wanted to make a place more livable. Um, we also prevented, as Chris was saying, sort of avoided costs in flooding uh, damages. And there's an estimate uh, on the slide, I think, it's hard to tell from here, uh, of $582 million in damages over the lifetime of the project that, that we'll, we'll avoid. Um, and as we see more climate chaos, that number might actually be low. Um, and this is a project that makes Dubuque resilient, right? It considered residents, it considered businesses, it considered um, climate chaos, but it also um, addresses many other things in our community. So roundabouts are another um, interesting piece of sustainability. They're clearly an engineering feat, but they meet our triple bottom line. They have environmental benefits. They are really great at reducing greenhouse gases because there's less idling and less fuel. People aren't sitting at stop signs or stopping and starting. They're moving through the intersection quickly and it decreases air pollution. Um, the economic benefits are that it helps access businesses and it um, slows traffic down a little bit so people can stop and see what's available 
and then likely stop and shop. Um, and they're also less expensive to maintain. So from a city perspective, um, they're not a, um, they're a good investment, let's say. Uh, and then for equity benefits, like I said, improved air quality, but what we know about air quality is that it's typically worse in communities of color. And that's true of Dubuque and everywhere. And so if we can continue to implement roundabouts, we can help with that air quality issue. Um, and then it also offers a lot of pedestrian safety um, improvements. So we have two already built. We have three as a part of uh, the Southwest Arterial, and then we have many others in, in the plans to help people access jobs and access um, other amenities that the city has to offer. Uh, and these also offer equity benefits with that, through that access. So for our residential developments, Wally sort of talked about it, but as a part of the Unified Development Code, we have sustainability points. Um, it's a minimum of 40 points that you have to get, and you can get a large chunk of points depending on which kind of design you use in your residential housing development, or you can add up several smaller, um, smaller, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, uh, efforts to add up to those 40 points. So that includes planting native trees and vegetation, um, offering bike and walking trails, uh, flood mitigation efforts, and, and many other ones. And um, we have an example of the Switch Homes Development Project that Wally mentioned as well, and it exceeded the requirements by more than double, and then they stopped counting. Um, it, it has, it's using updated energy codes, so the state of Iowa can only use 2012 energy codes, um, but there are much more recent energy codes that you can build to. The homes are solar ready, um, and then they also offered several other sustainability designs. So it's possible, it's affordable, um, and it's really going to be important to help us meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals, but also um, make Dubuque more resilient. And then climate action. So through our greenhouse gas reductions, we're at more than 27% reduction, our GDP has continued to increase. So it's not an either or, it's a both and. And uh, clean energy jobs are part of this. There's a local economic uh, benefit to solar installed. At $1.20 for every dollar of solar that's installed, you see an economic boost in the local economy of $1.20. Um, energy efficiency in commercial buildings offers huge savings. And, um, and then the avoided cost due to climate change. And then uh, we're seeing increased climate disasters in the county, and so we want to continue to adapt uh, so that we can avoid these damages. And then lastly, I just want to say, um, I don't know if you heard on the news today, but the, the heat wave that's happening in Texas. So they're saying that two-thirds of the entire grid in the United States is, at, um, is, is vulnerable because of this heat wave and the energy demand that it needs. And so these are the sorts of things that we need to think about. Again, going back to the interconnectivity. What's happening in Texas doesn't feel like it impacts us here, but it very much does, and it could. And um, our climate action plan estimates that with the heat, uh, the hotter summers that Dubuque will see over the next 70 years, we'll see about 155% increase in energy use. And so we need to be prepared for that. And that means public and private partnerships working with our um, utility, but also making sure that we are protecting our most vulnerable residents, um, both from heat-related diseases, but also then um, access to clean, affordable energy. Uh, so just as a reminder, before I pass it on to the real Anderson, um, <laughs> no person or sector is responsible for making Dubuque a livable, viable, equitable place. Um, we're all responsible for making it resilient. and if we follow our model that we created more than a decade ago and consider the environment, equity, and the economy as we move forward, uh, we, will, we will make that place happen. So thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council Members, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Corey Burbach, Assistant City Manager. I am the real Anderson, and here today uh, I'm, I'm, I have the privilege of 
presenting the final uh, few slides to you with an amazing coworker, Brian Moose. Uh, so today, we'll have the privilege to talk about the Equitable Poverty Prevention Plan. And so I'll go to the slides, if they're on here. Typically, what I do is find the people who are smarter than me. Brian, you want to come and put this up? There we go. So just giving you guys a little uh, background, and for those who are here today, a little background about why our department was created. And so in 2018, uh, the previous council uh, decided to make poverty a top priority. Why is that? When you look at the comprehensive plan under economic prosperity, uh, there was a few things that our residents called out for all of us together to address. And I want to name a, a few. Uh, the first thing, uh, low wages. Wages were an issue in our community. People were working multiple jobs and still couldn't meet basic needs to survive in the community. Uh, the second thing that they called out was we needed to address what is a, a livable wage in our community. The third thing that they talked about was poverty. They said, although there was a lot of exciting things going on in the community, for some reason, not everyone was experiencing the same prosperity. And as a result of the voices of the residents and our council members listening to them, we hired a consultant to come to Dubuque to listen to real people who are experiencing poverty. We also had the consultant talk to a variety of partners who are working with those who are living in poverty and said, what can we do collectively to create a plan forward to make sure that everyone is experiencing prosperity? And on the screen, you see eight determinants of why people are experiencing poverty in our community. And as Gina was mentioned earlier, these things don't happen in silos. Uh, for many of our residents, they are being impacted every single day by multiple determinants every single day. And so after the consultant came, met with a variety of people, uh, looked at both local and state data, and worked with our community to develop a plan, she came, Public Works LLC, and provided you with a recommendation. And one of those recommendations was to create a department that will focus on bringing partners together to move the work forward that was in the plan. As Rick said, there's a variety of plans out there, but it means nothing if we're not looking in those plans and working with the community together to address. And so our department was originally called uh, the Washington Neighborhood uh, Department, and so our department was morphed into uh, the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support. Um, and as I have shared with you multiple times, I still remember the phone call that I received uh, from the city manager, and he made it very clear, don't forget about the neighborhoods. Because in this work, it's not about just giving people money. It's also about making sure people have the political and social power to influence what community means for them, which is why we have a program called City Life to make sure not only do residents know how local government functions, but also how can we put residents on boards and commissions to impact what community means for them. And so I think that is very critical to the work that we do. Again, it's not just finances that people need. They also need the political and social power in this community. So in our presentation today, you're going to hear a little from me and a lot from the person who does a lot of the work behind the scenes. Part of our work focus on data. And we want to make sure that we give council, uh, per your request, an update on how are people doing in our community. You hear a lot about the infrastructure and the process that the city is putting together to make sure that we're business friendly, that we're an equitable community of choice. But collectively, how are people doing in our community is something that we should always ask ourselves. And are the collective efforts improving prosperity for all or just a few? We also want to talk about each one of the determinants to give you an update on the data that was uh, previously provided in 2018 and give you an update for the most recent, which is uh, 2021 uh, census data. And you made a priority to ask, 
what is a livable wage? In multiple of our plans, we talk about in Dubuque, if you're born here or moving here, we want to make sure that residents have a living wage. Well, today, we're going to define that for you as information. So I'm excited to invite our data analyst, Brian Moose, to give you a variety of data. And hopefully, you have a lot of questions for us afterwards. So Brian? Mayor Kavanaugh, City Council, Mike Van Milligan. Uh, good evening. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting a lot of you because I've been, you know, stuck in my office crunching all of these numbers. Um, but I've had the privilege of serving in the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Support since Halloween of last year. And so uh, very humbled and honored to serve the city of Dubuque in this capacity. And so to start, we'll start with demographics of Dubuque, starting with the population. So as of December 8th of 2022, the United States Census Bureau released its most recent uh, American Community Survey. And in that survey, it dictated that there was 59,379 people in Dubuque. Over time, um, uh, these figures are for the city of Dubuque and not the entire county. Uh, we have seen an uptick from 2020 to 2021, moving that we're moving in the right direction. Breaking this down by race, uh, we are sitting at roughly 88.4% white, 4.2% black, 3.4% two or more races, 2.5% Latino, 1.6% Asian, 1.1% 1 .1 Pacific Islander, 0.8% some other race, and 0.2% Native American. And it's also worth noting that the ACS is self-reported, so these are things that people identify as personally, and they use smaller sample populations um, and not the you know, entire 59,000 people that is reflected in that initial figure. So here is that population trend since 2018. Uh, the most obvious one, because it's the only one you can really see, because it is the largest pop or the largest majority, is that white population, which has declined 2.1 percent since 2018. Now, breaking that down further, uh, we've seen a bit of change in our minority populations. So, for our Native American population, they've actually they're actually down since 2018. Our Latino population has been flipping every year. Our Asian population has been down since, was down in, 20, in 2019, but has been growing slowly since 2021. We've seen an increase in our Pacific Islander population, and there was an increase in the black population in 2019, and it's been pretty steady since 2020. Breaking this down by gender, uh, we have Dubuque with females being 51.8% of our population and males being 48.2% of our total population. Moving on to poverty, our current poverty rate is 12.3%. This is 3% lower than the US average and 1.3% higher than the Iowa average. The historical poverty rate, we're doing pretty well. We're down from 13.2% in 2020 to 12.3% in 2021 and down about four points from 2016 where we had an all-time high of 16.8%. Comparing this to the 11 most populous cities in Iowa, we're also still doing very well. We're the fourth lowest city with a 12.3%, with the average without Dubuque being 21.4%, and the average with Dubuque being 15.9%. So we are bringing that average down by about seven points. Here is a figure looking at poverty and unemployment rates by race as of 2021. And so this, is, this population is just individuals who've had their poverty status determined. And so also just to mention that racial groups, for all racial groups in this figure, all of them have margin of errors that are in the double digits just because of the sample size. Um, and so notable ones are a 12.6% margin of error for black unemployment and a whopping 33.2% 33, margin of error for Pacific Islander poverty. And so because of this, there's, there are limitations to utilizing this data, but I think that you know, this is just something to showcase to see if we are moving the needle in the right direction, just comparing it with past years of the American Community Survey. So here are differences between 2018 and 2021. Uh, again, that margin of error is super high for our Pacific Islander population because they are not very representative in our general population. And so that rate was 38% and it has since doubled. Again, the margin of error for this is 34.9%. So it is hard to accurately measure um, from just what the American Community Survey says. And here is a similar figure showcasing unemployment rate by race, and again, the sample size is just very small, but we do see a notable decrease in Latino unemployment. 
And so a lot of times when we're talking about unemployment and poverty, a lot of people are thinking, well, why don't those people just go to work? And I think what these figures represent is an increase in people participating in the labor force since 2015. And this specific universe is for people who are 16 years and older. So it's not counting people who are under 16. This next figure is just the poverty rate by gender, with females with a 14.6% poverty rate and males at a 9.8. Both of these figures serve as a low since 2017, decreasing about 3% for our female population and about 5% for our male population. Looking at the labor force by gender, we've seen kind of a flip between the males and females with an increase of about 2% since 2015 for our female population, and then a dip from 85% to 83% uh, in 2021 for our male population. So here are child poverty rates since 2017. Uh, we started at a 23.1% and are at a 13.6%, which I can say is a success, but there is more to this story. And so while child poverty is declining, We've seen an increase in 2019 for free and reduced lunch that has kind of stayed steady since 2019. However, the difference is when we measure this is that the official poverty measure for a single adult or a single parent is roughly $19,000, whereas our threshold for free and reduced lunch is about $25,000. So this discrepancy in how we measure, you know, it doesn't really paint the, the correct and comprehensive picture that we need it to. Here is the historic median household income since 2011. From 2019 to 2020, there was a 1.3% increase. And from 2020 to 2021, there was a 2.6% increase. So utilizing a linear regression model, I was able to take these past years of data and calculate what these what the median uh, household income could look like in 2023, because this was from the months prior, in 2027, and in 2031. And so these are reported at a 95% confidence interval, uh, meaning that there is some um, areas for, there is some margin of error here of roughly about $6,000 to $16,000 for the latter figure of 2031. And so looking at home ownership by race, um, we are lacking when it comes to our disparities between different races. And when we compare this to the state, we're kind of keeping on pace, but you know, there's still some discrepancies, especially with our Pacific Islander population at 10.7% and a 24.5% uh, uh, estimate from the state level. Now looking at educational attainment, uh, this is for the population of 25 plus. And this is educational attainment for people 18 and up by gender. The following figure is median earnings by gender from 2015 to 2021. And as you can see, there is a huge wage gap between what people are earning based off of their sex. Um, and this gap is not necessarily closing since 20, from 2015 to 2021. And I think the next figure illustrates this uh, a bit more strongly is even with similar education levels and degrees, there is still a huge gap between how much people are earning. And so this brings the next part, so we're about halfway through of the presentation, of the need for a living wage in the city of Dubuque. And so why a livable wage? And it was, it was one of the first things when I joined this office that I was tasked to do. And 63 is the reason why. 63 is the number of times a living wage was explicitly said or alluded to in the Imagine Dubuque 2037 plan and the Equitable Poverty Reduction and Prevention Plan. And so what is a livable wage? It can be described as simply as a wage that is high enough to maintain a normal standard of living. But for our context, utilizing the ALICE methodology, a living wage refers to a salary or income that enables, that enables individuals and families to afford the essential expenses required for a decent standard of living, such as housing, childcare, food, transportation, healthcare, and technology. And so utilizing this methodology in research report from United for Alice, who is a driver for innovation and research in the United States, uh, the Office of Shared Prosperity and the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, specifically Alex Baum, um, 
basically reverse engineered this document to determine what a living wage would be for residents. And so the living wage calculation for Dubuque highlights many things, but perhaps the most important is the reality of what poverty is and how the working poor in our community fall through the cracks, even though our poverty rate is declining. I would like to highlight that our living wage model best serves as the absolute minimum that someone needs to survive. It is formatted from a survival budget that basically serves as a bare bones budget for what people need to survive in specific communities. So our Alice living wage measure has multiple categories. The first is housing, second child care, food, health care, technology, transportation, a 10% miscellaneous, so this is just the entire budget and then 10% of that, and then taxes. So after six months of research and you know, treating this Alice methodology report as our Bible, this is the, this is the uh, calculation that we came to. And so for a single adult in Dubuque, at a bare bones budget, you need about $25,299 to survive in Dubuque. For a single parent, that figure is $42,000. For a family of four with one adult working and the other one providing free childcare, it is $63,000. And for two adults with two children, with both of the parents working and needing childcare, it is $78,000. And so it's important to note that when comparing our report to the report that was just recently or going to be uh, released by Alice for the state of Iowa, we don't incorporate tax credits into ours. And so there is about seven to $8,000 that can be deducted from this when tax credits are applied. But for the sake of this model that we um, had developed, those aren't, those aren't incorporated. So if they were incorporated, that number would decline. And so when we're looking at hourly wages for one adult, after taxes, you need $13.18. For a single parent, it's $22.24. For two adults, two children, with the ages being two to three and four to five for each child, it's about $33.03 for one adult who's working. And then for a family of four with both adults working, it is a combination of, a combination of wages that add up to about $40.80 or two people making $20.40. And so as I alluded to earlier, the way that we view poverty changes the way how we address, how we address it, how we pre prevent it, and how we, uh, and how we reduce it, excuse me. So the way that the federal government measures poverty is through the official, official poverty measure, which has been described as $14,580 for one person, roughly $20,000 for two people, and $30,000 for four people. Our measure is almost double of that. And so just for reference, here are the realities of what poverty looks like. Our one-person measurement is at 173% of the official poverty measure. Our measure for two people is 216% of the official poverty measure, and for our families of four in Dubuque, it's at 261% of the official poverty measure. And so this just goes to show that the way that we view, measure, and address po poverty are flawed, and this measure is a way that we can kind of ameliorate these historical you know, um, challenges when it comes to measuring poverty. And so we did this not just for 2022, we did this all the way back from 2015. And so we've seen a significant increase since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And since 2015, the annual wage has survived in Dubuque for a family of four has risen 16.58%. For a single parent, it's risen almost 14%. And for a single adult, it's almost raised 18% just to survive since 2015. This graph showcases just the vast disparity between what our budget for a four-person four family and what the federal government um, deems as poverty. And so again, this has risen 16.58% since 2015. So this figure is the projected living wage using that same model that I had uh, alluded to earlier. And so again, with for the 2023 number, there's a $6,000 margin of error. For 2027, it's a $10,000 margin of error. And for 2031, it's a $16,000 margin of error. But I just wanted to include this just to showcase what the reality of what the living wage could be in the near future. In partnering with My Sidewalk, which is a research uh, innovation based out of Kansas City, they provided us with the projected living wage um, that is 
a bit better than my calculation, uh, for the median household income. And so here's a more accurate representation of what the median household income may be um, in 2031, and then comparing that to what the reality of the living wage may be. And so this part of the conversation is who is really falling through the cracks? And so when we're looking at median household income by race, um, we have you know, our black and African com community households at $35,000 and some other races at $85,000. And one of the outliers that I believe personally in this present or in this current slide is that Hispanic Latino households are making $71,000 for the household. But when you break this down per capita, typically a lot of Latino households, speaking from personal experience, um, are multi-generational and they have more people in the households, which equates to, which equates to a higher uh, median household income. And so when we view this from the lens of Alice, we have tons and tons of families from specific racial groups falling under these thresholds. And so again, just as a refresher, that single adult threshold is $25,299. For a single parent, it's $42,000. For a family of four with one working, it's $63,000. And for a family of four, it is $78,000. Here is the income per capita or individual earnings by race. And so you see that Latino number drop down from 71,000 to about $19,000 per individual who's earning money. And the average for, or the average for a total, for the Dubuque total population is $32,000. When you add the lens of the Alice, we have most of our groups for single parents falling under that $42,000 threshold. When you break this down by household, we have 3,857 uh, single adults falling under that $25,000 threshold. We have 12,000, or sorry, 1,200 single parents falling under that threshold, and uh, uh, roughly 1,000 families of four falling under that threshold. But when you look at the percentages and how much of the population they make up, we have 60% of single parents in Dubuque falling under that $42,000 threshold, 60%. When you break this down by race, we see things that are even more concerning. For our black and Pacific Islander communities, we have 95% of them and 93% of them not making that $78,000. We have 80% of them not even making $42,000. And this calculation, because we can't break it down further, only includes black households that have children or Pacific Islander households that have children. So they may have more than two, they may have three, they may have four, and they still aren't making what we deem is enough for a family of four. So here are the percent of Alice households uh, since 2016. And so we've seen pretty consistent figures, regardless of external factors that have been influencing everything else. So to get into the weeds of everything, this next and final portion of the presentation is breaking down the budget and the painstaking labor that uh, myself and Alex Baum went through to be able to present this to you today. And so the first category is housing. We utilize HUD fair market rent trends for Dubuque because that's what the methodology from United for Alice for the state of Iowa report utilized. And so though prices dropped after 2017, they have since stored. And one thing that I like to note every time that I presented this data is that yes, we are using HUD fair market rents. In all honesty, these prices are likely hired and this can be confirmed after a quick Google search or going on Facebook Marketplace. And so recognizing this is the strength of our personal study, is that we have the ability to utilize and to utilize and leverage local voices through the community equity uh, conversations and just getting on the street and talking to people to allow for local quali qualitative data um, to represent how people are actually feeling and incorporate their voices into this. Childcare. So childcare for someone who doesn't have children has been the one thing that I hear about almost every day. Um, and it serves as the most significant monthly financial burden. And while prices dipped in 2021, perhaps due in part to the reluctance of the workforce to return to work post COVID and do childcare themselves, or perhaps just the lack of demand which drove down prices, they are now rising exponentially as seen on the chart with the steepest climb for this indicator taking place in 2022. And it's worth noting that childcare serves as, serves as a prime example of the cyclical plot problem that we are trying to tackle. Because childcare workers are typically paid, paid less than a living wage, there's no real organic incentive to bolster that specific role in the workforce. And because of this, the prices rise and the accessibility dwindles. 
Looking at food, we calculated a monthly food expenditure utilizing a thrifty food budget from the USDA. The calculations in this model are more than conservative, indicating that you and I would spend way more at the grocery store. It only tallies what the USDA um, considers necessary, and to ensure that the data was localized, we utilized the cost of food index developed by Feeding America to adjust the overall cost for our geography. And so like the other categories, we see a climb in post-pandemic uh, we see a, a climb in post-pandemic times, um, as we do in, with many other categories, with that figure being $870 for a family of four, and that's a monthly, very conservative figure. For healthcare costs, this is more than just your basic premiums. It includes medical supplies, over-the-counter drugs, and other medical services that have to be made out of, that have to be paid out of pocket. It is one of the more consistent and predictable indicators with slight peaks in 2021 for a family of four and single parents and a slight peak in 2022 for a single adult. It's also worth noting that for most people who are uninsured, they have higher health care costs due to the cost of emergency services. According to the Iowa Department of Health Social Determinant of Health data set, black patients utilize emergency treatment at a much higher rate than other demographic groups. This has been attributed to a lack of preventative health services and less frequent regular checkups. So transportation, is, it includes a multitude of factors. So averages for gas, maintenance, license or registration fees, the depreciation of a vehicle, the average miles driven by people in a specific, in specific age groups per year, and then the absolute minimum payment for liability insurance. And we did this for the most popular small and medium sized sedans from 2022 to 2015. And so one of the ways that we realized or was key for us is that depreciation has increased throughout the years, making transportation much more expensive in a way that many of us never consider. And so in 2016, we see an all-time low um, for all age groups, and that's because gas prices were at an all-time low in 2016. And then in 2022, when I shed a tear every time going to the gas station, um, this is also reflected in this calculation with the monthly transportation cost being $1,067. And so what is driving up the cost of living? Virtual drum roll. And it's two things that we can note. And the first one is steep and sudden, sudden climbs in essential expenses. And the second one is stagnant wages. We've seen steep increases in food, transportation, and especially childcare costs in the last three years. And this hasn't, been in, this hasn't been improved upon with our minimum wage being stagnant since 2009. So what are we doing as a community to move people out of poverty? And I think one of the ways, and one of my good partners, Greater Dubuque, um, is Opportunity Dubuque, which is a workforce solutions program that upskills people who are underemployed or unemployed. And so I wanna give a big thank you to NICC and Greater Dubuque um, and their leadership for leading this effort um, into upskilling our underemployed populations in Dubuque. And so this has been a long presentation. It's 9-11, it's almost past my bedtime. And so here are a few key takeaways that I deem are important, and I think you should too. The first one is poverty is decreasing, but not for all. And while poverty is decreasing, the growing income gap remains a pressing concern. It's time to bridge the divide and ensure economic prosperity reaches all the corners of our community. Additionally, the decrease in poverty is evident, but our understanding and measurement of it needs a serious update. The way that we experience poverty is evolving, and traditional metrics no longer capture its full impact. Poverty is not just a number, it's a complex web of circumstances that demands fresh perspective and innovative solutions. Let's build the social, political, and economic power for all communities in Dubuque. Prosperity should not be a privileged, but a shared aspiration. Programs like City Life allow residents to become more involved in the city governance processes and gives them the ability to influence policies and programs that impact them. Mayor Cavanaugh, as you hopefully remember from our joint presentation in the QC at the Rooting Out Poverty Conference, our participation in city life has increased greatly with applications increasing 591% since fiscal year of 2021. The second key takeaway is something that I wanna quote directly from the comprehensive plan. My vision of Dubuque is to be a place where workers are paid a living wage and where there are job opportunities for low-skilled workers. And these, these aren't my words. These are, the, these are the voices of our citizens who are voicing a need for a livable wage. The concept of a living wage takes center stage in this plan, appearing 63 times. 
It's clear that supporting programs and efforts that promote a livable wage is vital to our city's well-being. And it shouldn't be a luxury. It's a fundamental right that empowers individuals, uplifts communities, and fuels economic growth. And should, this should be the vision of all Dubuque residents, regardless of your zip code, race, socioeconomic class, gender, or your affiliation with the Hawkeyes or the Cyclones. <laughs> Together, let's expand Opportunity Dubuque. By providing opportunities for unskilled and underemployed populations, we can help them enter the workforce a workforce and build a brighter future. We must strongly encourage employers to participate in the earn as you learn model, encourage their employees to participate in programs that are designed to skill them up and pay them a living wage. Again, I want to personally thank leadership from Greater Dubuque and NICC for their efforts in spearheading this um, opportunity to skill people up. And finally, our secret sauce, our secret formula, people, planning, and partnerships. The city must remain steadfast in its commitment to supporting employers and employees alike. We should stay on track, providing the necessary resources and initiatives to foster a prosperous and inclusive community. Progress should not waver. It should be an unwavering force that uplifts businesses, empowers individuals, and forges a city where success knows no boundaries or identities. Thank you. I encourage any questions. It's a tough act to follow. But as a former teacher, I've been requested to come up and administer the pop quiz now. So if you take out your pencils, <laughs> just kidding, none of that. Uh, but we are ready for your questions. Um, I think most of us have stayed. So whatever you would like addressed in, in more depth, we are here to answer for you. And we're just, I'm really uh, glad for the last presentation, which shows us here's why we do it. You know, we talked about the economic development efforts that we have made, are making, plan to make, and how we can make that happen. But why we do it is because we want everybody to be prosperous in Dubuque. And I think you've got a lot of people in this room who care. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jill, very much. And thank you, everyone, for the presentations tonight. This has been. Um, I think just an excellent, excellent night of presentations and um, obviously uh, definitely drinking from a fire hose of information. So thank you very much for doing it. Thank you for all the time you spent. Uh, I know that city staff has spent a lot of time preparing these. Um, and, and Mike, I just want to say thank you before we get started for, for getting this set up and, and having this conversation. Um, and I'll let everybody think of their questions while I finish my uh, opening statement here. But, you know, I've... I've sat through a lot of presentations at this desk, which I've appreciated very much. Uh, you know, I talk about the budget process quite a bit when we're going through that and we get to hear all the things from every single department. But there was something unique about this one. I, I've, never, I, I've never received the historical context that I received this evening on what it is we do and why we do it in its entirety. Wally, you're right. You talk about this stuff all the time, every time we come here, right? Um, and it was nice seeing some other faces other than yours to be able to give this presentation. So thank you very much, Wally, for that. That was, a good, that was good thinking on your part. But, but all, all kidding aside, you know, the, it, it really is helpful to have a full understanding of what this means, and not just for us. I think it's really important that we all, anybody who's here and anybody who's watching, understand the purpose of this tonight. This is for the entire city of Dubuque, the entire community, our entire region, to understand this process more fully, figure out where we can make improvements, pinpoint those improvements and go after them and continue to make the progress that we're making, but then also make improvements in the places where we seem to be stuttering a little bit and not able to really get moving. So with that all said, I know we have questions. I know that I do. Um, that was round one. We're ready for round two. So we're gonna, we're gonna be here for a little bit longer to make sure that we get all the questions answered so we can have a fuller conversation when we leave this room tonight. That said, let's open it up. Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. My first questions are for Mr. Wernermont, please. And um, I know you talked about you're trying to have improvements in the process, and it's just amazing all the factors that go into development agreements, uh, so many technical processes, so many moving parts. So could you tell me what is the typical average amount of time required from discussions to final approval 
of a development agreement around? Um, so for a development agreement, maybe Jill Connors might be the best one to answer that. I could probably answer how long it takes a site plan review or a subdivision plat. But uh, Jill gets involved with a lot of the financing that begins with that, which is part of our process to the end for that. So, I mean, there's multiple variations for that. I don't know if we can tag team this question for you, David. So. Hey, while we do that, um, Felicia, is it Felicia that controls the lights? Could you please turn all the lights up in here? There, it is getting near nap time, so thank you very much. <laughs> there's cookies in the back. Oh, that's right, yes. And they're all gluten-free. Yes, so. there are cookies for anybody who wants Danny, them, so feel yeah. free. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll step in real quickly here. Um, what our department handles is, I would say, side by side with what happens in, in planning and zoning. If there are, if it's new construction, there's a lot more that needs to take place in the DRT process, and so that can make things go a little slower. I think our record was we got three development agreements done in about four days, once upon a time when there were historic tax credits in the balance and there was a special meeting on a Thursday. When, anyway, it was crazy. That is very atypical, atypical. We very quickly got the first Simmons mm -hmm. development agreement in place in five weeks and that was an Olympic feat, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it depends so much on how, how many moving parts there are on, on Wally's end. But as far as when we have all of, all of the details in place of what needs to go into the agreement for what they're building, what their commitments are, what the city's commitments are, et cetera. And then we have to bring it to city council twice, once to set the hearing and once for a public hearing. And as Prenna explained earlier, that can be a longer, you know, up to 30 day process, but typically when we set a hearing, we set it for the next meeting, which is just two weeks later. But I would say on average, maybe a month, we might touch it unless things kind of drag out and, and details change in the conversation. Okay, okay, thank you. So, I mean, the improvement, improvement to the process, part of that improvement is aimed at making it faster, or is that a concern? Um, it, 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 so once again, for the development agreements, there might be multiple things. It might have to go through a zoning, through a, a border commission. It might re require a plat. There are certain development agreements that will go through that don't even have to go through those processes that are already in place. But the in intention is to, for the development process is to um, review site plans and subdivision plats in, in a faster manner. Um, a lot of that it comes in, involves with um, you know, the ability for staff to review things in, in, a, in a certain time frame. But there are also certain things that come across our, our table is the completeness of the application initially. Sometimes we'll get applications that'll come in and they won't even go through a pre-application process. We might get a site plan or a subdivision plat that will show up and has actually gone through that, that initial discussion. And sometimes there's additional reviews that, that takes for that. But the, the intention is to sit down, listen to those developers, um, engineers, and surveyors and in addition to architects and say what's working and what's not working how can we improve the process how can we get to yes faster um, what are things that are barriers to to the review um, just like jill mentioned we did have a, a development agreement that came through that involved a, a rezoning a site plan an annexation a development agreement that all happened very shortly in a, in, in a very short period of time um, for those reviews, but then also depending on that level of the demand of the development, like major subdivisions do take a longer time because there's a lot more to review and there's a lot more that gets involved with public dedication for those, so. So there's a wide variety of development agreements and um, I'm sure you're gonna be taking stats and we need data, of course, about when mm -hmm. they start, when they end. My question, second question is about, most of what we heard tonight was non-negotiable. You need to have this, you need to do this. It has to go through the fire department and all this. Now there's some negotiable parts too. So could, you know, the mutually beneficial elements for the developers and for the citizens of Dubuque. So when do the negotiable parts come into that process? I don't hear, does that start right away that developers would like to know what type of, of negotiating uh, uh, you know, some of those negotiating elements, when does that actually come up in the process? 
So when you, when you talk about negotiating elements, like who's going to be paying for what and the costs associated with that and the benefits that, are, that may be involved with the development, um, that's something that's typically handled, you know, specifically with Jill um, through the process and, and when there's an ask for the development. So in the past, there really wasn't much of an ask because we didn't have residential TIF for opportunities to be able to provide that until you guys just recently adapted your, your requirements for that. But um, other developments that come involved with it, like I said, or like you just mentioned, you know, it's required, it's required because of this code There's in certain things. And those are life safety issues and those codes are in place for a reason. But the negotiable certain things that, that come into play, is there that ability to have flexibility in some of the regulations? Can we look at it a different way? But then also when it comes to the funding mechanism, you know, what's that impact to the, to the city and the taxpayers? Is there a benefit um, for the development? Um, and those, all those are negotiable. All those are being discussed um, through a development agreement typically um, and, and those different conversations. So everything's a little bit different on a case-by-case -case basis, but I, I can't have anything that could pinpoint exactly down to a certain science. But All right, thank you. So when the developer brings it up, that's when it enters the conversation. Yeah, uh, basically, yeah. Okay. Can I speak? Uh, yep. Sorry. Yes and no. I would say there's a lot of times on the very front end, if they come to us and say, hey, we've got this project, we're going to create X number of jobs, we're going to build this building, they give us you know, some cursory information about it, we're very upfront right away saying, all right, well, we're very happy to provide 10 years of TIF, you know, do a, a land grant uh, on the cost of the land and the development center, that kind of a thing. So we share up front you know, what typically would go into an agreement. So they have some sort of an idea of, of what they can count on before they have questions even. Great, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I, I would like go to ahead, expound yeah. on that a, a little bit. Um, it is really very clear um, on most of our projects what incentives the city offers. You know, for instance, what the mayor and council passed last year on the housing incentives, that's on the city website. Any developer can look at it and know exactly what they're eligible for. Now they have options, and so th they could talk about that, which, which benefits them more, but it's very clear what they're eligible for. And the same thing with industrial development. If you're gonna create um, 10 good jobs, at least 10 good jobs, um, you're eligible for 10 years of 100% property tax rebates. And if you're buying land from the city, you're eligible for up to 50%, or no, you are eligible for a 50% land discount. That's very clear. It's been like that for a very long time. So anybody that contacts us or the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, they can with great certainty answer their question about that. Now, if they have nuances within their development, absolutely. Then, you know, they're buying an existing building or, or it, it's on a piece of private property or, they have to do an annexation for part of their their prop their project because they don't want not enough of the lands in the city. Then things can get to be some nuanced, but generally it is just very clear from day one. Great, thanks, Mike. Ms. Farber, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So I would like to go a little bit beyond that and talk about the initial sales business development for the city of Dubuque and how a corporation might approach um, the city for an interest in wanting to build and expand here in Dubuque. Um, I'm a little curious, uh, Jill and actually Rick Dickinson maybe can assist, as to where do they go first or how do you two work together with the two organizations to get us to that initial state where there is an agreement on a potential opportunity which then can follow what I consider the flow chart here to talk about incentives, to talk about the terms and conditions, to kind of get the um, attorney's office to kind of get a, an agreement established so that the DRT can start its work to get it to um, uh, occupancy, if you will, based on all the detail that was received tonight, which by the way was absolutely outstanding, very educational and greatly appreciated uh, for all the work that is done in that DRT. But I'd like to better understand the exact pre-work or the conditions and, and what, what the process is like when you initially 
have an opportunity that comes our way and or we, re we do the research and we find opportunities as any corporate business developer might do if they were in this kind of a role. As I mentioned earlier tonight, the large majority of the projects that we handle are business expansions. So they're businesses that are already here in town. I want to say it's close to 90 percent of the of the jobs that get created in the development agreements that we that we negotiate are with existing businesses who have decided to expand here in town. Those businesses already have relationships with the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation staff, and so very typically that is where they start. They'll talk to Rick and his team talk about we're thinking about this and what do you know and what can we learn from the city and then in those Wednesday meetings that Rick talked about he'll let us know they're thinking about this are we all on the same page so they start that ball that conversation rolling with us and act as a liaison and I'll let Rick say whatever parts he wants to add to that obviously God knows what um, <laughs> Greater Dubuque Development Corporation is, is not a gatekeeper, they're a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And we have a close working relationship with the city. Uh, we expect that if they get a call about a project, they're gonna call us and then we'll work together on trying to meet the needs of that particular employer or developer. Um, Greater Dubuque Development also has a responsibility not just in negotiating um, on behalf of the, of the employer, the developer, uh, the city incentive package, but also the state's incentive package. So there's now a, a project questionnaire that needs to be filled out. We work with the employer to do that. There's a full application that needs to be present. We're the only city in the state of Iowa that actually attends any, the only economic development group that actually attends every single uh, state economic development meeting, whether we have a project before them or not, so we understand what other folks are getting and to make sure our employers get a fair shake. But most importantly, I think it's, uh, we should share that the client for Greater Dubuque Development Corporation is the employer. The partner is the city. That's fully disclosed to the city. The city knows that we're there in advocacy for the client, um, yet they invite us to the conversation realizing that's our responsibility and we can work with them on a daily basis, whereas the client is trying to make a buck and do their job day in and day out. So that means that you're the you're the initial point of contact, and then typically you, yes. Typically, okay. we notify the city of the employer or developer's intent mm -hmm. uh, to expand or to reduce operations, and typically we get the lead from uh, partners, utilities, Black Hills Alliance, the Iowa Economic Development Authority, or site locators from around the country about a prospect, and then we take that to the city. Uh, assuming we have a product that meets the prospects right. needs. Right, and then there's Ma some, Ma oh. could, could I, would, you mind if I yeah, interrupt a little bit? Because I really think that, and I can't believe they would miss this, but I think they're missing something really important here. So the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation interviews over 300 CEOs every single year. They have full-time employees, it's, that's their job. And that's what we meet about every Wednesday, is okay, what did you learn in your interviews over the last week? And sometimes it's something really small, like there's a pothole at the exit, you know, all the employees don't like running over the pothole or we need a stop sign. But lots of times it's, well, we're thinking about doing a $10 million expansion. So really lots of times the GDDC actually finds out about it by engaging the employer, not the employer calling them, even though that certainly does happen the other thing is, and, and Rick said this, um, but I think it's a really important point, is while they're our partner, they represent the businesses. They don't represent us, the city of Dubuque. And so, you know, when, in this material uh, for tonight's meeting, there's a map in there, and it shows a seven county region. And the seven counties is Dubuque County, and then the six counties that abut Dubuque County. And of those six counties, two of them aren't even in the state of Iowa. One, of course, is Grant County, Wisconsin. One is Joe Davies County in Illinois. But you look at these different counties, we're not the only ones with industrial parks. So Keeler, Wisconsin, which is only seven miles away, has an industrial park. 
Um, Dyersville, which is 23 miles away, has a, an industrial park. Piasta, which is nine miles away, and I'll say again, only nine miles away, has an industrial park. And some of the other smaller communities have very uh, small industrial parks. But back to this idea that GDDC doesn't represent the city of Dubuque, when they engage with those businesses, they, they look at what's the best thing for the business, not necessarily what's the best thing for the city of Dubuque. And lots of times our competition on these projects, even when they're local businesses looking to expand, is not this seven county region. We can't think of that as our competition. We have to think of that as our partners. It's Tennessee, it's South Carolina, it's Florida, it's Texas, it's Oklahoma, and Kansas in a recent project. So then we definitely are partners trying to put together a package and convince those employers that we're the best choice. And quite frankly, most of the times we win. Mm -hmm. We don't always win. But anyway, I, I, I do think that they actually seek out more of the projects than actually get brought to them. Okay, thank you for that. And then I have one other question about the um, developers roundtable that is going to be reestablished. And, and I looked at all the stakeholders that you had discussed. Um, and my question is, um, can the city council be invited to at least audit uh, that kind of a meeting, maybe on a rotational basis, just for education and understanding? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer that question. So uh, working, we're working with the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation to uh, be the facilitator for this because we think it's important that developers and businesses uh, feel that they have a third party who is f facilitating it and it's not purely a closed loop city process. And so that's why we're uh, looking to contract with GDDC uh, to facilitate it. So as part of that process, we uh, in our discussions with them already, uh, what they've talked about is um, they don't feel it'd be productive to have every meeting just open to the public because then there may be people that aren't willing to speak their minds. And so the intent is that there would be a series of meetings where developers would be invited to come. Then and on a periodic basis, probably every three months or four months, three or four months, there would actually be a public meeting where if other people wanted to come and say, oh gee, I wonder what kind of things are talked about at these meetings, they'd be welcome to come and hear it. And they might have an opinion about something like a, a way development should go into Buke. They might not be a developer, but they might have an opinion on it and it's a valuable opinion. And then every six months, there would be a developer's round table report through a work session to the city council. So we would have GDDC, the facilitator, would come to the city council every six months along with our employees that you see here tonight and give you a report. How is this developer round table thing going? And you'd get a chance to ask questions and you know, obviously, and like always, anybody can call you at any time and give you input. Okay. So that would be our idea of making it a, a three-tiered process where there's an opportunity for candid conversation without uh, you know, the public scrutinizing everything a developer might be saying and maybe then criticizing the developer for saying it. Then there would be opportunities for the public to have input to the developer's roundtable because they might have great ideas. You know, we recently heard some people that had some opinions about um, how a wildlife were impacted in the development. So that would be their chance to come and say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about in those roundtable things, but I hope you're talking about this. And then we'd every six months come to the city council so you could find out what's going on and ask questions about it. Well, thank you, because I think the public-private um, collaboration is extremely important. And if this is um, a real discussion um, about the business environment in Dubuque, the economy in Dubuque, and growth for citizens and growth for our business community. I think it would be important for us to somehow be uh, in the loop here. So that's a great suggestion, and thank you very much. And those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Spring. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have three questions. I'll start off a question for Jill. Uh, Jill, you had mentioned there, you gave us a handout here of 90 million in all these projects that's estimated from FY23 to FY28. Um, 
You mentioned 23 million is going to be spent on prop on to the residents. What were those projects listed in here? Mike, we talked about that 23 million earlier today. I didn't have a list in front of me from those different CIPs for that 23 million. Yeah. What do you, so they were on private property. Yeah. So what those are talking about is the. Uh, um, let me look at where they start. For like the uh, Washington neighborhood one. Yeah. So where that $6,103,182 assistance for home ownership, mm -hmm. that would be the first one. Mm -hmm. And then if you just go down that list until you get to where it says ICE Center, that would be the first one that's not. So all the ones from low income small business grant all the way up to uh, assistance for home ownership, those are the ones that add up to that number. And so you can see those are all programs that go direct assistance to either developers or property owners uh, to help them with their projects. And that's what's in the current uh, city budget from fiscal year 23 through fiscal year 28. I was thinking it was six, but really that's almost nine projects, nine different programs, programs right. that are going to help our, that the citizens are paying for, so they're kind of getting this yes. funds back. But Mr. Sprint, real quick, can I just say something real quick? Because you're talking about a document that we're sitting here looking at. I want to make sure, you know, that we had a lot of stuff flying at us as city council members from a document standpoint. It it's PowerPoint. all, it, this, is this in, in the public documents as well, what we're looking at? Or, I guess uh, my no, biggest question we'll is, have to get Adrian to upload this one into yep. the documents because, no, we just did this doc, this thing this afternoon just before we showed That's up. what I thought, yeah. It was in one of your last PowerPoints that you showed, Joe. It was, but it didn't list out the project names. And, uh, and so I think okay. it's, so So I appreciate your answer, Mike. And uh, I was gonna ask you that, Adrian, okay. as far as that and PowerPoints and everything that was involved that wasn't attached to this will be attached to it. Um, yeah, and actually forward. what we'll do with this one, these actually each have a page number in our capital improvement program. So a person can go ask and actually read, which the CIP is on, on our city website. So we'll add the page numbers that they are in the CIP. And then if a person wanted to read, well, what is that one? They can actually go and read about it. Excellent. So, and, bef and then we'll give it to Adrian tomorrow to, to upload onto the, the site for this meeting. Excellent, sorry, Mr. Right, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, because this list I'll, you mentions tons of like amenities, quality of life things, a lot of things that a lot of citizens may, are, re are kind of aware that they're happening, but they may not be totally aware that they're happening because it's just, it's a, it's a lot of funds that we're not aware of. Yeah, and the, um, the other thing as I would point out about this list, this $90 million list, this is only downtown and riverfront projects. Yes. We also have another list, which is the industrial park list uh, for the west and the south end. And so we can also get that tomorrow too. And it also, we can put CIP numbers on it. What was the number on that one, Jill? It was $26 million, I think, in the next six, some, something like $25 million in a six-year period in the, the capital improvement program budget for industrial park development. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't answer that question. Uh, my question was to Chris about the broadband. Um, when was that officially gonna be complete? Because I know there's a lot of folks in the downtown and the North End and the Point neighborhood that are just waiting to get fiber to their homes and businesses. Sure, Chris Coleman, Information Services Manager for the city. Um, it's part, I, I, that's something I can provide to you is the status and kind of what's happening next. Um, Imon has a very intentional plan of how they built their ring first and then kind of work through the city and kind of swoop and then yeah, that's not a technical term, but kind of went around the edges and then built inward. So um, I don't know the exact time that downtown and North End would be um, on the schedule, but I do know the, the infrastructure's in place in terms of the loop. So, but that's something we can find out for my mind for you. Thank you. Sure. All right, appreciate it. And then my last question is for Mr. Rick Dickinson about um, how many years again, Rick, with the Greater Dubuque? You've been there? Uh, well, Greater Buke has been in place uh, for 39 years uh, this fall, and I've been there for 28 of those. I think I'm the fourth director of the, uh, of the agency. Okay. Uh, the question goes back to, the question kind of goes into the whole thing that the discussion with deals and things. Mm -hmm. If you had to throw out maybe an average, how many deals have failed because the city's been Dubuque? 
because the city has been difficult to work with, in your opinion? Well, the, the largest number is that the city did everything they asked and we still didn't get the project. Um, because as the city manager stated, it's an extremely competitive process, especially when a company is doing a, a, a site search, a national site search. Uh, the, the culture at Greater Dubuque Development and the culture for uh, the, the Dubuque County is we don't make, uh, we don't submit proposals uh, that aren't true. If we in fact don't have the product, a key component that that prospect is looking for in order to maintain a relationship with the utility or a site locator, we don't blow smoke. We either have it or we don't, and if we tell you we have it, we guarantee you that we do and we can perform on it. I would say that there's been more frustrations, especially of late, with local projects on expansion or new projects with local developers than there has been with outside developers looking at Dubuque. I think our process and, and the ability to expedite a, a proposal in, uh, in uh, uh, quick step uh, for a new proposal is better than most in the country. Uh, it's things tend to slow down when it's an existing operation uh, things also tend to, down, to uh, slow down when they don't include Greater Dubuque Development. That's a frustration for us is when an employer does not contact Greater Dubuque Development about being there in advocacy for them. We're not the gatekeeper, but they're one more voice to work with the city continually to try to find agreement on an issue. Um, several of the, the projects were identified in the first letter from, uh, from uh, the, the writer included projects that we had nothing to do with and we were not brought into the conversation until it was all over but the crying, which is very unfortunate. It's not to say that we could have made a difference, but we would have tried. And I am optimistic enough to think that we, we could have succeeded. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to Go add ahead, that yep. one of the changes we didn't mention in this list is we are trying to be uh, more intentional about if we get a direct contact, bringing us bringing GDDC into the conversation. Because quite frankly, even though they're mostly a pain in the hind end, you know, they're an important part of that pain in the hind end. Um, you know, so many times the developer or the business, they have, they're, you know, they're making widgets. So they're not familiar with this process. And while, you know, we don't do anything to trick them or fool them or anything like that. It helps to have somebody like GDDC on their side who understands everything about our system. You know, everything you saw tonight, they've known for years. And so that they can say, well, gee, did you think about this? Oh boy, no, we didn't think about that. And so we're trying to do a better job of bringing them in, even if the developer or the business didn't bring them in. Thank you. Hey, Rick, don't go anywhere. I want to, I want to actually, I want to continue on with Danny's line of questioning, if you don't mind. Really? Um, Are you done, Mr. Spann? Yeah, okay. Done. All right. Um, just, <coughs> you mentioned it a little bit, but if you could identify the places, and I was going to ask the same question for some other people later, but if you could identify from your vantage point, the places where the greatest heartburn exists, the, the greatest headache in the process. Um, and, and this isn't, I want to be really clear about this. This is not a question where I intend for any one person or any one department within the city to get thrown under the bus. This is a process question. I want to know uh, what is it that we can do differently in the process that could be useful or helpful in expediting things or moving things along a little bit more. Where, where are we getting stuck? Well, uh, time is money, so that's the first. Uh, the quicker we can get to yes or an issue that needs to be resolved, before we can get to yes, the better off we all are. There are times when folks in the private sector, they want an answer and they want it yesterday. And so the longer it takes, the more irritable the negotiations become. Um, next, I, th I, I, have, uh, I have concerns about the city's approach and insistence upon long-term leases in excess of uh, uh, 25 years or less versus 25 years or more. Uh, it's very difficult to finance some projects uh, with 25 years or less as a lease. I think that has been a, a hindrance to some development. I also believe that price points should always be based on market value, uh, not on assumed value. 
And I think it would be, the city would be better served uh, to uh, have commercial uh, realtors evaluate a property and come to market value as a determining factor as to what the price point should be on a lease uh, or purchase. I think, uh, first of all, I need to take this advice myself. I think it's important that we, even if we uh, tell somebody to go to hell, we ought to make them feel good about the journey. Uh, it's about being able to say no and, and do it uh, uh, in a professional manner and, and uh, always be willing to uh, discuss uh, issues um, uh, and maintain the civility of all conversations on both sides. And I've uh, had concerns about both sides, actually. Uh, it's not a one-way street. Um, and I will tell you that, uh, that one of the things that, and this is on us at Greater Dubuque Development, uh, especially with the, the, the most recent uh, uh, concerns expressed and grievances expressed, I do believe they think we're too close to the city. Greater Dubuque is too close to the city of Dubuque. I've had people say, uh, you should uh, decline to have any funding from the city of Dubuque. And by the way, the city of Dubuque is less than 50% of our funding and the private sector is the balance. Uh, my question, next question was then, do you think the private sector would pick that up? And the answer was no. You just lay your people off. That's what they think about what they do and how close we are to the city. Economic development, good economic development is a razor's edge. In a, in a uh, relationship that we have, the city should always feel we're a little too close to business, and business will always feel we're a little too close to the city. And, and it's important that the uh, funding of the agency would be balanced not one side or the other. I appreciate that answer, thank you. And I think this is the kind of candor that we need to have in this public conversation about this, is you know, when, we're, when we're talking about where the, where the difficulty lies, that's, that's where the difficult conversations occur, and we have to be able to open that up to be able to talk about it. The other thing, though, too, that I wanna make sure that we don't forget about, because we talked about it a lot tonight, is don't forget to look outside of this 10 county region or seven county region that the city managers pointed out. We did, the city staff did a tremendous amount of work comparing Dubuque to other places. And I found those comparisons rather enlightening. I think it was pretty interesting to see what other cities are doing. We can't forget about that either because we also don't want to just be out here on an island by ourselves doing things in a willy-nilly kind of fashion that doesn't involve some sort of metric that that is there. So to, you know, as, as, I think when we think about the work that you're doing, it does need to be compared at GDDC and in concert with the city and with the businesses and developers, it needs to be compared to other places and what they're doing too, because they're, we can't forget about the successes along with the challenges that we have. Uh, Mike, did you have something to add to what? Oh, Rick, go ahead. Go ahead if first. I could, uh, first of all, I, I failed to mention one other thing that I do have concerns about, and that is the, um, the process of determining the developer's responsibility as it relates to infrastructure. I thought Wally did a great job about stating the case, uh, but I would much prefer uh, bricks and mortar being built and having a marginal intersection than having a mar marginal intersection and no building being built. And I think that's the cons that is the concern I have with the city's policy currently regarding to infrastructure. Uh, I don't care what other people do. What I care is about what we do and how we move things forward. Uh, if the infrastructure is already there, and in many cases it's not in Dubuque, unfortunately, uh, we certainly then wouldn't assess someone for a development that had been there for 10 years on that intersection in a vacant lot. What we are is struggling to be a new, a new community and a growing community that has to simultaneously have property for development and infrastructure, infrastructure to support that property. I think we need to look long and hard at our traffic studies and not extrapolate what we think it means beyond what they say it means. And we shouldn't start requiring the financing of infrastructure based on what we assume will happen in five or 10 years. It's fine to have a conversation with that developer and say, and, and say if these things develop in five to 10 years, this is the funding formula for the improvements to the intersection. But let's not, let's not uh, put a full stop on things, and, which is a hindrance, I think, to, to some development and part of the, uh, a growing angst in the development community, community in our market, regardless of what's happening in other communities. 
Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, well, I, I've got to add something that I wasn't going to say uh, since he spoke up with his added thing. Um, this will be an example of where we're going to have to agree to disagree. And so we'll be coming back to you with some recommendations. And obviously, Rick will be able to advocate for his position and other people will be able to advocate for theirs. But I wanted to go back to your question about, about changes um, or things in the system that maybe are gumming it up a little bit and could we improve them. And uh, this is not throwing anybody under the bus. We as staff have had conversations about this that the design review team is designed to be a problem solving process. And since developers are saying they're having some problems that aren't getting solved, we probably could work to improve it. And so uh, part of our conversations with the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation as they facilitate this newly formed developers roundtable is we're asking them that's the first thing we would like them to facilitate a conversation about with the developers is how do we think we can improve the DRT design review team process because we think it can be improved. So that's a two way street, if I could, Mayor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if I thought Wally gave a good summary of, of DRT and, and improvements that need to be made, especially in light of uh, coming out of the, uh, the pandemic. What we are going to do at Greater Dubuque Development, we will be attending every single DRT meeting in person for any client that has a matter before the DRT commission or group. Uh, and we will summarize that uh, meeting. We will contact the developer and or business after the meeting asking their level of satisfaction with the outcome of that meeting. And the result of that, we will be sending to the city manager's office. And um, that would be very that's helpful. in addition to what we've, we've always been there, but I think we need to take it to the next level on our level. I think sometimes we, oh, it'll, it'll work out. We'll get something fixed. Now we're gonna be more intentional about bringing any agreement or disagreement to the attention of the city manager. Thank you for that. All right, open it back up here. Ms. Roussel, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think this question would be for Wally. It, both Wally and Gus, in your presentation, you had specific proposals for um, process improvements. And I wondered, would this be the kind of thing that you would wait and send it through the developer roundtable? Or how will developers know? And how can they then have input on those proposals that you, that you had? Yeah, definitely. Some of them will, we don't have to wait until the developer's roundtable. Some are, you know, improvements we make now, but certain questions with regards to how can we improve our, our applications and checklists, that'll be definitely something that'll be involved with uh, the developer's roundtable. Um, certain things that can be identified that um, they see is, uh, you know, a barrier or a cog in, in the process to be able to go through that. So definitely a lot of these things will be able to be bounced off the developer's roundtable. Um, because that open and improved communication is what we need to understand. Um, we conduct certain things. Sometimes we just work directly with our engineer. Sometimes we don't even talk to the developer or the business owner. Um, sometimes that communication is just being handled through that, uh, that engineer or project engineer. So just open communication um, with regards to everyone that's involved with the development process. But yeah, definitely some of them will take place currently because that's something we can do now. But um, a lot of decision makings and everything, we just need to listen to our developers and what they need to, to do, so. Gus Ahoy, city engineer. I think that commercial street issue will bring forward to the council at one of the next meetings, just because I don't think there's any harm either way on that at all. It'll just be an advantage to the developers. I think that's what we talked about with city staff. Thank you. And then I had one other question for Wally, as long as you're, mm -hmm. you're here. Um, something that you commented that sounded like a good idea to me was um, some software for the development review that, that could speed it up and, and make it more, uh, well, more electronic. Mm -hmm. um, what, is there a timeline or a possibility for that? Yeah, so um, currently uh, we're pulling other cities and seeing what other software that they're using. Um, the Housing and Community Development Department is actually looking at a plan review software as well um, through that. So there's a, an opportunity for partner with them to see if we can use the same 
software to be able to do the, the, the plan review, the uploading of the information. But one of the key things that I'm looking at is, you know, that's processing, but where's the opportunity for a developer just to check in online and just see where they're at in the process? Or, you know, we're, you know, we're waiting on certain comments from a certain department. There's some accountability that that software will be able to hold. So it just provides a little bit more information um, and makes it kind of a one-stop shop for people to be able to look at it. So. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Hmm. Good. Yeah, um, Ms. Wethel, you, you good? All right, Ms. Jones. Mr. Jones, sorry. Just a comment. You can sit down, Wally. <clears throat> um, I think one of the things that uh, COVID robbed from us was interpersonal connection. And I think one of the giant steps towards making everything flow better and flow easier and flow more comfortably is getting people back to the table in person, face to face, and having the opportunity to get to know each other and know each other's needs and understand each other and watch faces as you're, as you're expressing things to see if you're connecting or if you're bouncing off and if your message is on target or not. Um, I think that's a big one and I'm glad you're doing that and I think that's, that's one that you do as, as soon as you can, obviously. Um, I, I think that uh, we had a lot of talent in the room that, that didn't get to speak tonight and uh, it's a long night anyway, but I'm, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you stuck with us. And I know that pieces of our future are in your hands, every one of you. And I'm glad you're here and willing to work with us to, to make it all better. And we want that too. We want, to, we want to find a way to yes without a lot of bruises. And sometimes it's gonna be no. Sometimes it's gonna be, this doesn't fit what these seven people up here think ought to be in the city of Dubuque. And that's kind of our job. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a reach too far for us. That's our job too. Um, but when it's not, um, it's time to talk, and it's time to talk face to face in person so that we understand each other and see each other and get each other and get to know each other and get to experience each other so the next one goes easier and the one after that goes easier yet. Um, that's gonna be our, our strength in the future, and I, I applaud us for moving in that direction. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Ms. Wethel. First, I do want to share my gratitude with city staff, um, not just for your preparation and presence tonight, but for your daily commitment to the citizens of the city. Um, your service does not go unseen to me, and I know too many. Thank you. Um, thank you also to the members of the community who are here tonight um, with uh, personal and professional concerns. Also for those who are um, watching tonight to learn more and work with us. One of the great privileges of this service as your councilwoman is feeling a connection to my neighbors and my community. And much of that is meeting folks at the grocery store, having coffee with them, seeing them at school events, maybe having a patient tell me about uh, what they think on speed cameras. Um, it's how I learn, it's how I know how I can serve best, and it's so helpful for me to have personal connections. Just Friday, I received a phone call from a constituent who I've never met, who called me out of the blue and was inquiring for a neighbor who didn't have the means to do so, how they could best replace a lead line and who they should contact. We spoke that day that he called me and left me a message. I shared what I knew about the current programs and I discussed with him that I had already reached out to our administrative team to connect him with the best person to answer questions. Prior to recent letters from business leaders in our community, I was not contacted by a single name or business on the signed letters in the weeks and months prior. Some of those individuals have had my personal cell phone before I even ran for office. Some contributed to my campaign. Others had my sign in their yard. You cannot say that I do not listen when you do not speak. I want to say simply that I am here to listen and to serve. When concerns arise from any constituent, for any reason, I ask that you contact me. Do not sit in a tunnel of echoes. 
Let your needs be heard so that I have the opportunity to earn your trust and do my part. There's something in healthcare called therapeutic communication. And Mr. Jones alluded to it a little bit. It is something that in nursing practice is really important. And it can be something as simple as when I walk into a room, how do I sit in front of a patient? How do I show them that I care? What's my body language? What are my words? What is my facial expression? And actually through COVID, it was really hard because people couldn't see my face. Sometimes they could barely see my eyes. And so I feel that all of us could go back to those lessons of what we learn in healthcare about how to approach one another with kindness and civility, with respect and dignity on both ends. For all of us, for all of us in the city, when we receive a phone call to call back, when we are engaged in a conversation to make eye contact and to say that I am present for you and I understand that we're here together to get work done, whether in the end we'll agree or not. But I would challenge us all to take this as a learning opportunity, everyone, everyone in our community. I am here because I want to serve you, but I cannot serve you if I do not know what is needed. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Resnick, go ahead. Thank you. So the city council is involved with development agreements. I'd like to get uh, Ms. Romwell involved with this too. I looked very carefully and uh, look forward to your uh, closed session um, uh, smart part of the presentation. And if you wouldn't mind commenting on what I'm going to say, and then, and, and I'd love to have your input. Are you there still? Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Thank you. So. You, you commented on the number of closed sessions. So we get together uh, because of those, uh, uh, those reasons that require us to have closed sessions. And we receive information, a recommendation, you know, a good recommendation, a professional recommendation. We ask questions and then we provide direction. So we're part of that. Um, that's in general. And the council members, as Ms. Wethel uh, was talking about, are responsive to Dubuque citizens, but we cannot disclose closed session specifics. And an individual council member will not interfere with ongoing development negotiations with the city manager. So our form of government, the council creates a policy, the city man manager carries out the policy. I, I have another statement, but could you react to what I wrote, what I said, please? Yes, so you're correct that our form of government, the mayor and the city council provide the direction, the, the policy goals at the uh, 30,000 foot level. And then the manager is hired and is directed to implement those policies at the much uh, more specific level. So yes, that is our form of government. Um, related to closed session, the contents of the discussion in closed session are confidential and they remain confidential up until very specific items happen and related to the the specific item it, it could depend on the nature of the item on when that information may or may not become uh, available to the Ooh, Karina, we just lost you. You still there? I, I, I muted for a second because there's a, a nine-year-old. Just ah, a second. Yes, I understood. I apologize. <laughs> real, real quick, one of my favorite meetings during the pandemic was when there was literally, I, I think it was Colin from uh, Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative. His daughter was in the background just tearing things off the wall in his presentation. It was just the greatest presentation ever. <laughs> I remember that one. It was yes. entertaining. I'm bad. So sorry. Go ahead, Brenna. <laughs> um, so um, the the Iowa Code contains provisions, and so um, 
it, it depends on the type of closed session when information can be made available or is available. Um, obviously, when something um, moves to a public agenda, um, the information is put out there publicly and it is made available in its final form. Um, and then there are some additional provisions related to um, subpoenas and court orders and things of that nature. But uh, generally, um, broadly, closed session materials um, do remain uh, confidential. Did I address everything, Mr. Resnick? Yes, and, and thank you. Uh, I guess my comment is that I read in the paper or, or I read uh, from uh, these letters that we get that uh, folks are really ticked off at our city manager for direction that we have given him. And we can't talk about that, but he's out there uh, trying to put in uh, to practice what we have asked him to do. And so I think that needs to be, uh, we don't operate individually, we operate as a council as far as we're together, we listen to each other, discuss things, and then a, a kind of a head count is taken or the mayor comes to some kind of, well, here's where we're going with this. And we uh, generally agree with what the mayor has summed up. And then, then uh, Mr. Van Milligan goes out there and tries to get her done. So I just wanted to let people know that we are definitely part of this, uh, uh, the development agreement process. And I uh, wanted to let people know how we deal with that. Why we deal with it is we have uh, seven on the council and seven reasons why we're, we say what we say. But we, we have a broad spectrum of people here in Dubuque and we're all want to say what we want to say to help the citizens of Dubuque. And then uh, Mr. Van Milligan takes that and does the best he can with it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Rousseff? Yeah. I have, uh, I have a couple questions that are kind of in a, in a, from a different presentation, and it was from Alexis. And um, some of the things that we learned from some of our other communities that I really liked, um, I liked, she mentioned Cedar Falls has an idea for incentives of taking rentals back into home ownership. So I'd like to see if we could um, see what they're doing and uh, investigate that. And I also liked the fact that um, in Marion, they had a step-by-step -step guide, which I thought would be uh, very helpful for our um, developers in, in um, housing developments. I think anytime you have a step-by-step a, a -step process, it surely um, eliminates a lot of questions. So I would just like to state that those two things would be something that we should investigate. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. That uh, step-by-step guide was in my thoughts too, more on the lines of uh, just a simple flow chart that you'd get on, on first contact. It says, here's where we are. Here's where we're trying to get. Here's the steps along the way, and here are some of the detours and the reasons you might have to take one. I think that would help uh, people understand where they're, what they're getting into. Thank you. All right. Well, first, let me just say that I, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. And, and I think, um, you know, the conversations that we've been having over the last few weeks have actually been pretty good ones. Uh, I think that um, it's, been, it's been great to be able to, uh, to put some of this out into, into more of a public light in a full format like this. I think it's really important when you look at a picture that you're not standing so close to it that you can't see anything. You have to be able to step back and look at what's going on. And we have done a great job of that tonight. I mean, you have all given incredible presentations here. Um, you know, what I would ask of our, uh, our community partners, you know, this is all about development. Obviously, the developers come to the city of Dubuque and, um, you know, we want to work together. What I would ask is that we continue on in this conversation. I couldn't agree with Ms. Wethel more about civility, uh, especially now. I, I think this is where we can be different, and we should be, than the rest of our country and our region and the United States. I, I think we, we really, we can do a better job of talking to each other than other people can. Um, it's just something that we can choose to do and practice it. So let's do it. And I think that this, this is one of those conversations that can really, um, I mean, this is our, this is our future. I mean, this city lives and dies with all of us together. That's the way it works. So we have to be able to get through moments like this when we're having some hiccups, to be able to ha sit down at a table face-to-face. -face, I really like that, that we're moving back to more of a face-to-face -face model for some of these meetings. It's, it seems so simple, but it's really important, I think. And we, we, did, we did discover that in this process. And I think it's important that we do that. I do want to invite anybody from the community to know that you know, we are your elected representatives. 
So we are your local elected representatives. And we are here to listen to you and work with you and make the suggestions that you have to our city manager and staff and everybody who serves you. Everybody who works for the city is your public servant. And, and trust me, they know that and they think that and they believe it. It's, it's who they are. But that's the same for everybody who's sitting up here. We, we feel the same way about that. And I trust that for this council that I'm sitting with. And I know that I can say it for myself that this is something we're choosing to do because we love the city and we love working with you. And it's not always easy and we really wanna do it. So please do reach out to us and let us know what we can do. Um, you know, more than ask questions here, I just wanna, uh, because most of the, the questions that I wrote down were asked and I just wanna close this out here so we can all go home and get a, a good night's rest. Um, you know, we, with all this information that we shared, I think there are some really important things to, to recognize. First of all, we are not failing at development by any stretch of the imagination. We just simply aren't. There's just no good metric to be able to prove that. Um, when you compare us to other cities in Iowa, we're, we're doing pretty well in certain regards. There are some things we could learn from them that I think we might want to think about. Some, Ms. Roussel had some suggestions. I think we should look at it a little more closely. Uh, I know that city staff has looked at that, but I don't think they've done as deep a dive as what you did for those last couple of weeks really getting ready for this. Um, same goes for the, our, our private partners in the development world. Uh, I think there are some other places that are doing some things that maybe they could teach us, and not just on the public side, but also on the private side to be able to do this a little bit better. Um, I think some of our incentives that we're offering are actually very, very useful. This housing incentive stuff, I mean, 1,700 units, we're not kidding around here. This is, this is good. I mean, we're doing a really good job with that. We can't stop. We need to keep going, but we're doing a really good job. So let, let's keep that up. There are some, some places where I think we need to keep uh, working on that process. I loved what I heard about fixing some of the processes that aren't working as well as we'd like them to. I think that I have full faith that we're gonna get that done. I really believe that we're gonna be able to sit down and make that all work out in the best way possible. In the end, um, I'm, I'm left with nothing but excitement at the end of this conversation. I feel very, very hopeful about where we're going and what we're doing. And I know that we can do it. And I know that we're gonna go home, sleep on this, think about it, and find ways to talk to each other a little bit differently, a little more successfully, a little more effectively going forward. Um, we got some other exciting things to talk about this week. We got another work session on Wednesday night that actually talks about some development that's happening in the city of Dubuque. Um, we have other things that are coming up on uh, agendas that are, that are gonna be happening. And I, I have to agree with our city manager. I think the next few years are, are a very exciting time for the city of Dubuque. So let's get through this together and work through some of these difficult conversations and figure out what we need to do next. But I really appreciate this conversation tonight. So thank you everyone for being here and being a part of it and for the conversations that we're gonna have in the week ahead. With that said, I see no more further business in this work session, so we will stand adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>